This episode of Bonfire Side Chat is brought to you by three things. The first thing, first and most importantly, always, our patrons at patreon.com forward slash duckfeedtv. We appreciate each and every one of you. The next thing it is brought to you by is a brand new show on the network, Days of Future Cast. Uh, if you go to daysoffuturecast.com, you can find the first episode of this show, which is me and Jeremy Greer, uh, noted Dark Souls aficionado and cultural icon talking about the x-men animated series and all things x-men third thing it's brought to you uh, i haven't brought it up in a while is souls of darkness the book i wrote that is dark souls related if you go to www.powerworlds.com you can find more information uh last little bit we did have some skype problems on this episode uh so we had a little bit of some delays with uh vadi him being in Australia and everything, so there's a little bit of overtalk. I caught most of it, but if some of it slipped through, I beg your grace. And on to the episode. Some of our landings were desperate adventures. We are now prepared to meet the inevitable counterattacks with power and with confidence. Dear little astronaut, where have you gone? Are you hiding from me? Come out. Come out. Don't be afraid. You were born a child of dragons. What could you possibly fear? Now, now, show yourself, Ocelot. My dear little Ocelot. My name is Gary Butterfield. My name is Cole Ross. And my name is Vati. And you're listening to Bonfire Side Chat. It is a perplexing alternate universe, alternate past, dark future favorite. Yep, it's a it's it's an inkblot's favorite. And uh, yeah. uh, this week we are talking about the consumed king's garden and the untended graves. And we're so excited to welcome back uh, Vati. Hey, Vati. Hey, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, one of uh, one of our most requested guests coming back. And uh, boy, when we announced this, people went nuts. So uh, we're we're super happy you made the time. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. I'm particularly happy that you got me on for such an interesting episode. Yeah. And I'm also a bit intimidated by how complex this area is. And I hope I do okay. <laughs> I hope I do okay. We, we, we all are. Yeah. Um, like I spent, um, you know, a good portion of the day kind of uh, attempting to bone up and kind of read uh, people's theories and ideas about this. And the more conclusive they are, the more uh kind of false they ring in my ears yeah um like mm. to me it is it is an area that's kind of about questions like i i have an idea of what i what i kind of feel about it but this is uh by far uh kind of the aspect of the game that i am uh, kind of least have my mind made up about yeah um, mm. yeah and so, yeah i totally agree it definitely has the broadest implications as well yeah you know, i i started out kind of nervous but then i kind of realized oh we can only work with what we're given Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I hope that everybody uh, extends us a little bit of grace um, if our mm. if our interpretation of this incredibly vague area doesn't quite match up. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, Vadi, uh, how I, I imagine most people who are listening are familiar with your work, but in case they aren't, uh, can you speak a little bit to uh, what you do in the community and how you uh, got into this? Sure. So I got into the community around the time Artorius of the Abyss was released for PC. I started making videos about that. Deleted most of those videos, so no one, so they would never see the light of day again. And uh, one of them stuck, though. It was the lore video on Artorias, and then I sort of found my niche within the community as someone who can try to bring these stories to life a little bit. Um, at the time, there wasn't many people talking about the universe in the sense of the characters that inhabited it. So I made a name for myself talking about those characters and making the world feel a bit more real. And yeah, so a few games later, we're at Dark Souls 3 <laughs> and we're at mm -hmm. the Untended Graves, which is probably the part, the area that definitely intimidates me the most and makes me question whether I've actually learned anything at all this whole time, because it's the <laughs> area where as soon as you start thinking about a theory, you follow it, you get excited about it, and then it gets completely destroyed by another fact that you missed along the way and in a way that's the best part of the souls sort of magic that it has 
Would you say that the <laughs> untended graves is the Dark Souls of Dark Souls areas? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, it it has because throughout the entire Souls universe, there's the fact that time doesn't make very much sense. There's the fact in Dark Souls Three, especially, that space doesn't make very much sense. And in the untended graves, it has that fact. It reiterates that throughout every item description you read, and this area is confusing not just because they leave out parts of descriptions like the rest of the game does, but because they baffle you with time paradoxes and space <laughs> paradoxes. So yeah, yeah. And it, and it doesn't have. I mean, we'll we'll definitely get to it, but I think that's kind of exacerbated by it not having a uh, a clear demarcation. Um, the way other, you know, in Artoria of the Abyss, when you kind of started making videos, that has a very clear, like, oh, I'm getting sucked into mm. a portal, and it's very easy to tell the chronology that this is the past, and, you know, and, and that's very clear in a way that this is less clear. Um, mm. Yeah, exactly. with this one, you quite literally stumble into it. Yeah. Um, and the more you kind of... Uh, I, I really liked that like that uh what you said there about the more you think you're you're certain about it the kind of the the slipper it gets it's kind of like one of those like if you go to a museum gift shop and it's one of those like inverted balloon kind of things like a little rubber tube that's full of liquid that if you try to hold on to it just kind of slips out of your hands that's what this mm -hmm. is to me exactly <laughs> those yeah. little slippy snakes yeah yeah the um yeah so i mean people are listening um you know i think that most people listen uh watch your videos i know i watch them uh you know day and date when they come out and it, it was a really big thing. Um, you know, I still, I'm sure I said this last time you were on the show too, but I'll, I'll say it again to talk a little bit of sugar about you is that the, uh, <laughs> when I was first getting into the games, when Cole and I were just thinking about uh, doing this show, um, when I had that feeling, you have it like the edge of your mind that there's something else going on, but you don't quite know what it is. Uh, and Cole was like, Hey, you should check out these, these videos. I don't know the camera, the name of the guy who does it, but they're called prepare to cry. <laughs> and then went mm. on, uh, went on YouTube and then kind of, uh, you know, obsessively consumed it. And yeah. even though, you know, some of those old videos that I, I you probably erased, like there's one <laughs> where there's, uh, the Hydra has little, uh, word balloons, um, <laughs> oh around gosh. him, uh, yes. dark, which I thought was very funny as well. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. I sort of departed from doing funny videos because, I mean, when you work on a funny video, you know, you go into it thinking, I'm going to have to be as funny as possible. You laugh at the jokes, you make the video, and then you watch the video for the thousandth time, like you do with all your videos, and you stop laughing. And then by the time it goes to press the <laughs> upload button, you're thinking, is this even funny anymore? What have I created? Like, this, no one's going to laugh at this. So, uh, yeah, that that's um, that's a product of a bygone era, that, yeah. that Hydra video. I think that was a tale of two adventurers. Yes. No yeah, that's, uh, no. mm -hmm. uh, no, Cole and I not. could learn a lot from that. We just we just make the joke and then don't think about it at all and put oh. it online before we can have self doubt. Oh yeah, then... we just we just fire it off. We we we, we don't yeah. even listen. We only listen to the parts around where we need to cut something out, and then it just goes. And then we do, <laughs> yeah. and then somebody will say, "Oh, that was funny." I'm like, what are you talking like, about? We didn't funny. say I don't that. Remember doing any of that. It's a really weird life. It's a lot it's like tough. a like a Christopher Nolan movie that we're living. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it is uh so you know i'm 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 a big fan i guess is another way of saying it so i really appreciate you coming on mm -hmm. uh coming on the it's show no. yeah. um cool what did we do last time well last time um at least in the order of the show uh it may be different for you when you played but uh, on the last episode we ventured below irithyll and its dungeons to find this profaned capital in the source of pontiff sullivan's power um, and after defeating Yorvan the Giant, uh, uh, apropos of nothing, uh, we, uh, you know, defeated our last Lord of Cinder in Yorm, and then things started to get weird. Yes. Um, so this is kind of, uh, usually we do kind of a lore summation here, and we'll have a little bit of that going on here, but most of that's going to be, a lot of those questions are going to be the content of the episode. Right. Um, essentially what happens right when this begins is we get teleported back to Lothric, which is an, an area... You know, I, I remember kind of, this. <laughs> yeah, I, I had stopped thinking about it um, because I had been kind of uh, consumed and interested in the story of, of Sullivan and Aldrich. Aldrich. Um, but now we're back to the city that has been torn apart by this kind of war um, and back to this, uh, this, you know, this, uh, this maiden, uh, this, this uh, boy, what is the word of that lady? Um, she's the, uh, she's the high, pre high, yeah, high you. priestess, mm -hmm. Emma. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Emma, who, uh, who takes us back and... We're not going to actually kind of get into the actual Lothric proper, the castle yet. We're going to do this kind of side side path. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the thing that, you know, we have learned a little bit about in our journeys away from Lothric um, and just in some of the descriptions that we've gotten is that basically any kind of royal authority um, in, in, in Lothric uh, is kind of sitting absent. Um, they're kind of like abdicating their duties or, you know, wrapped up in something else. Um, and here in this episode, we're going to kind of like see what's kind of happening at the, uh, at the outskirts of that court. Yes. Yeah. Um, for a portion of it. And then right. the other portion gets way more ontological, <laughs> uh, than that. Um, and kind of plays into that central thrust. Um, so this is, uh, this is the last Lord of Cinder we killed, which was, was your arm. This can also be Eldritch. Uh, and you actually get kind of yanked away from here in a move that I don't particularly, I don't like that that much, um, that you get Mm. actually just teleported back to the space. I wish there was a more elegant way to do that. Um, and it's also, is it, uh, I believe, and if one of you guys, if you're a memory that it's the same kind of teleportation signature that, uh, Lothric or yeah, the Lothric uses. Um, In the sense that it has a light of light ring around your character when they teleport you. Yeah, yeah, you're... it looks it yeah, mm. it looks the, like the same kind of magic effect. Um I which so. is interesting. I think so too. I, I didn't get a chance to to play it again and double check. Yeah. Uh today. I mean, I played this part. I didn't get a chance to make it up to the the princes to see that teleportation yeah. effect again it, in this playthrough yet. It would stand to reason because Emma is the one who's bringing you back. She's kind of, you know, issuing this incantation, you know, begging you to save Prince Lothric's soul. Um, she probably, as the priestess, maybe taught Lothric the magic that, you know, did that. If she mm-hmm. is bringing it back, mm-hmm. like, I could, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem like that big of a leap to to, to connect the two. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, the priestesses um, and their order has a lot of connections to things like the Blessed Weapon Miracle. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you definitely get the impression when Lothric fights you that he was, you know, taught by them and coddled by them and brought up by them and his magic shows that, but also just his story in general, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, his swaddling he's clothes. the chosen one. <laughs> they kept him in this, these powerful clothes throughout his entire life, <laughs> the prayer set, and raised him up. So it makes a lot of sense. There'd be a connection there for sure. Yeah. What's more confusing to me is why she's dying as soon as they pull you back. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it, does that imply that the dancer killed her and she's pulling you back? as you know to help her or is it more of a situation where she recognized or felt that you killed enough lords to be summoned there but then that doesn't explain why she's dying so yeah. do you guys have any thoughts on that one a grand coincidence that <laughs> that the designer is kind of invoked to put you where to put you where you needed to be because who would have thought to go back to this particular place mm. Um, yeah, that's the that, gameplay kind of... sense. I mean, that's what it, what it feels like to me from a, a story sense. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, you know, as uh, the dancer is the only thing that makes sense to me there. Right. Uh, and perhaps the dancer is kind of just waiting in mm-hmm. whatever the mm-hmm. kind of sky dimension the dancer pull, you know, pours out of. <laughs> I love that. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's super, it's super cool. Um, <laughs> we should note though that, um, and we, I think we talked about this way, way back in the beginning of the season. Like you can actually do this boss fight. We're going to talk about here mm-hmm. pretty early mm-hmm. on. Yeah. Um, if you want to, it is, it is challenging if you don't kind of cheese it with a, a certain summon, mm-hmm. um, but uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's talk about what actually happens to to some of the dancer first, real quick. Okay. Um, yeah. So she, um, you know, so she's she's dying. She's in a pool of blood. Um, she repeats the the words of her, you know, please save his soul, and you get this basin of vows, um, which mm-hmm. the Lothric knights used in an induction ritual. Um, we see, you know, she's been standing. We talked about the statues she's standing in front of when we first got here of a a knight who is cutting off his own head. Yeah. Um, he's here. like kneeling into his own sword almost um gary mm-hmm. is it metal uh, it's very metal okay it's very metal <laughs> um i love the description on the on the basin of vows because it talks about you know like oh the the actual right serves no purpose but some things you just do anyway kind of mm-hmm. thing like mm-hmm. again just kind of this notion of uh going through the motions um mm-hmm. that kind of pervades this entire entry well if you think about um the idea of a right being enforced by someone higher up I think they might have the inclination to say, oh, this doesn't really mean anything, but it's reinforcing a theme of self-sacrifice and beheading is a theme of self-sacrifice that you see in a few other statues as well. You see them holding their head in their hands. And that's what it speaks to me of anyway, yeah. self-sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And I remember associating the idea that, you know, you've been beheaded with the fact that we put 
heads on thrones. And <laughs> I think mm-hmm. Lothric, the kingdom, has quite a big uh, investment in the idea that we should be doing that and linking the fire. Yeah. So I th- I'd say that's what the statue represents. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it gives it it adds a little bit of uh, additional kind of a weight or pathos to the fact that Lothric is, you know, forsaking that. Yeah. You know, mm. if, it, if it is a culture that values self-sacrifice, who values this thing, you know, to your, to your point, Cole, where it, it's kind of like this thing you don't do, but you uh, do it anyway mm-hmm. um, to an outside eye. Like that's uh, a sign of being arbitrary, but it's also speaks to kind of a, a something that's so ingrained that you don't think about it. Mm hmm. You know, um, mm. I, you know, I think about things in, in our culture, things that are just, uh, you know, uh, just pervasive. Yeah. You know, that that become, are just uh, become mindless. Yeah. Yes. Like, uh, like, you know, not eating people, things like that. <laughs> like we just know you just don't do that. Uh, you know, for example. Uh, uh, so, I think you, prote- you think you protest too much, Butterfield. You see, you see <laughs> let me let me walk you through real quick the process behind me saying that. The first thing that came to mind was incest. <laughs> And I didn't want to, like, if it was going to be a protest too much thing, I had to quickly zig to something else that okay. I thought. Uh, <laughs> because you knew whatever I threw out there, I was going to put right back in your court. Right. And I was like, what, yeah. is, what am I going to get pinned on me? It's too late to not end this sentence. <laughs> <laughs> what should it be? So, yeah. so I zagged to cannibalism and I'll take that. You okay. know? And hey, if I'm going to do the time, I may as well do the crime. <laughs> I mean, like, let's let's do it if i'm known as a cannibal mm-hmm. bibs out yeah yeah. Um, yeah but uh you know i i think that it, you know if, if it has lost meaning you know it, it especially uh you know is something that we do even though it really doesn't kind of um it doesn't uh reflect what's going on here anymore um and that that that, that seems kind of sad to me like there is pathos to this mm-hmm. yeah absolutely mm-hmm. um you know before you can actually get to this altar to put down uh, the bowl, we get this introduction to the boss. Right. Um, yes. As as they, uh, you know, water begins falling from the sky, and we look up and we see this very lithe, uh, very shapely figure kind of crawling out of this um, kind of frost slash water portal fr- from the ceiling. She's kind of uh, ringooing out, um, and she drops down, and we end up facing the dancer of the Boreal Valley. We've been waiting for this for a long time, right? Oh, man, this uh, is the first boss yeah. fight that I saw. Yeah, mm. exactly. It's probably the first boss fight most people saw. And when you go and talk to Emma for the first time and she's like, OK, go down that way. You're like, what? I'm so ready to fight something right now. I know there's a boss fight here. <laughs> there's, a, there's a big room here. Like it's even if you didn't mm. know, even if it didn't, you didn't know something yeah, exactly, was going to happen right? here. It like, feels like one. Yeah. Mm. Like, it, it feels like Amelia is going to come out from around a corner saying, I'm here again. Um, <laughs> um, this is this is either a place for fight clubs or a boss arena. Like there, it can't be neither. Um, yeah, and and this is I I love this boss fight. Like I like everything about it. I like the the kind of story about this character. Even though we don't know, we know things about the character. It's one of these things where I think that we can kind of define somewhat who the dancer is. Um, but how that ties to how all of it ties together is kind of trickier. I think. Mm. I don't even know um, that it, that it really has to. No, I mean it doesn't have yeah. to to be like evocative and cool, but like yeah. I'm just saying that like so the dancer who comes down, this is another one of the the outrider knights yeah. um who uh was was tied to Vort, who who worked with Vort, Vort would uh would follow follow her about. Um and we know from her descriptions and the things like that um that she was part of old royalty, the old gods. Yes. The uh, the, the specifically the uh, the old royalty of Irithel, that she was part of the Irithel court. Yes, yeah. um, and has ties to to Guinevere, um, probably a you know some kind of relation. Um, her soul can be made into a miracle that is related to Guinevere. Um, but we also know that uh, by becoming one of the Pontiff's eyes, one of these outrider knights, that has kind of turned her into this bestial, yeah. lanky, inhuman mm-hmm. figure. And, um, and the description of her armor actually um, kind of ties in and says, you know, it, it describes oh these magnificent. The magnificent uh, clothing and ar- and armor that is you know meant only for royalty. Oh, and because she's a beast, it is fused into her hide. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good detail. 
like that a lot. I mean, I guess what I was saying, what I don't know further than that is, uh, you know, okay, so it's like some some old royalty that Pontiff, you know, probably kind of came across and, you know, changed into one of these these Outrider Knights. Mm -hmm. However, we have ties from that old royalty, from Guinevere, also to the Lothric royal family mm. um, in some other ways, and where that kind of circle gets squared. Can you is en what can I, you enumerate that? Because we've alluded to it, but I want to make sure that we get it out there. Uh, so so very popular, and uh, you know, I, I think that we uh, bodies on this, you know, it, it is on this as well. But is you know pretty. It seems pretty likely that Guinevere is the queen of Lothric, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, based on based on several things. Um, so do you, that, that relation, why, um, this person who is related to the, the queen of Lothric Guinevere was in Irithyll and was turned into one of these outrider knights, I guess, is the, the blank that I'm having a hard time filling in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so the, like the, the closest, uh, kind of like way that that follows for me is there was a relationship between Lothric and Irithyll, Irithyll you know, both of those courts, you know, just trading wives back and forth, left and right. Um, Pontus Sullivan came to power, deposed the Irithyll uh, kind of royalty, um, mm. took this woman in as a dancer first, you know, first, and then kind of enlisted her as the outrider, thus exiling her um, and, you know, kind of sending her back to uh, to Lothric as part of just kind of this, you know, onslaught of assassins from pretty much everywhere trying to get in and take care of the royal court. I think that is the that is the clearest line of events that I can suppose. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the people of Lothric definitely seem quite opposed to the people of the Boreal Valley. I mean, you see uh, Emma say that the mad dog is guarding the way, and it's an, you, you can't really get a grasp of how these events played out, right? I mean, there was the the kingdom would have been based in Anor Londo, and then they got deposed by the pontiff, who took over with a lot of religious power and forced them mm -hmm. back to Lothric. But then Loth Lothric... It always struck me as sort of the central kingdom, and that's strange if you think about the fact that uh, Guinevere or the Queen of Lothric and all of them must have had power in Anorlondo at some point. Mm -hmm. It's almost like when they were kicked out of Anorlondo that Lothric became the new Anorlondo in mm -hmm. probably a few more ways than one, right? I'd say yeah. that maybe the fact that the wall erupted upwards, mm -hmm. I think that's mentioned in a description, yep. that the Great Wall appeared, it didn't, it wasn't always there. Mm -hmm. And you see that there's a bridge that goes straight into that rock face. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if when they met, went back to Lothric, that that the Lothric became the new Anolondo in a sense. And you kind of cordoned off the rest of the <laughs> the world almost. Yeah. Mm. You know, the, the kind of, that kind of schism. Um, I think it's in the banner that it says that that wall, yeah. wall kind of appeared. But it does, yeah. you know, kind of have a separation of space. How do we square those? that with the fact that Guinevere kind of after the events of, you know, the first flame fading, you know, got out of Dodge, you know, and left her, you know, weird recluse blood brother there alone. Like, you know, it's pretty Flan much all right. It's such a, what's that? Is, is such a sad also ran <laughs> from the flame God Flan. Who oh yeah. I has just forgot been about Flan. forgotten about, yeah. no, forgot about Flan. Yeah. No, I feel but... like the developers forgot about Flan. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe it's, I always reconcile that with the fact that she is a goddess of fertility and bounty. Maybe he mm. sort of chose the wrong woman. In a sense. <laughs> yeah, She's I, definitely good at running away. And why can't that include partners and husbands as well? Yeah, I suppose. Poor Flan. Yeah. I hope I we hear from Flan sometime. It's been a while. I forgot. I forgot this. <laughs> you know, I, I really did forget about Flan, honestly. Yeah. But I mean, just yeah. to... And surprise, second DLC is just like the kingdom of Flan. <laughs> it's all Flan lore and like the Flanites and... Uh... Boy... <laughs> You're just making me think of that mediocre dessert. Come on. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, just uh, but just with the fact that, you know, Guinevere kind of abandons, you know, you could say one way or forsake in Orlando, um, you know, to go off and kind of live a life elsewhere. You know, would, would Lothric have been the place where she went to kind of reestablish herself? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just the fact that it does have this kind of uh, this relationship. Like she went to, I think, you know, so she went to Lothric and then there is also, you know, there's definitely a relationship between those two things. Like mm -hmm. if she's fleeing uh, Anne Orlando to go to Lothric, there is a relationship between Lothric and Irithyll. Um, even if there is that that wall, even if there is this kind of separation, there are enough ties between them that it makes the actual chronology or the relationship between those two kingdoms pretty hard to suss out, right. I think. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have an idea for it. Um, yeah. 
So, it, so we end up with a character who, like, I understand as an individual, but not her place in the world, really. Yeah. You know? Mm. Um, well, that's um, always what Souls does. It makes you question the motivations of characters, right? We know where they are. Sometimes we know what they're officially there for, but why they're doing it is always the most interesting thing. So she's there, I think, because she's watching over uh, someone with great importance to the Unkindled, who is Emma. And she's I, probably, seeing as she's being the eyes for the Pontiff, I'd imagine the Pontiff, if he knows about the events and the unkindled and what Lothric's into, he might be a little bit afraid of the unkindled treading down his way, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Because he guards, he, but he guards both aspects of progression in Lothric, either mm-hmm. downwards or up towards, you know, yeah, towards the end of the game. Yeah. He Elders, is the yeah. gate. He, yeah. He is the gatekeeper to two Lords of Cinder, both of whom are sources of some measure of power, be it the profane flame, uh, with Yorm, which is, you know, the seat of his kind of elemental power, and then also Aldric, which is kind of the uh, seat of his symbolic power, at the very least, you know, mm-hmm. as, as kind of the, the, the basis of this religion of the deep. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, and then and then we also get into the fact that he might have a reason to guard this off or keep an eye on it with the ties that the area we're ultimately going to talk to you about when we get to the Consumed King's Garden, <laughs> um, how that ties to the dragon airy and how that might relate to the dungeon full of half dragon hybrids he's got going on under his uh under his kingdom so yeah it's uh i mean there's definitely i guess i could see the the reason uh why she's there um <laughs> Man, you know it is sullivan's a busy busy guy yeah, he was busy that day it is i mean it it does it does lend into that sense that i i have and i've, I've talked about this a bunch of the season where like fully half of the game feels like just kind of a Sol- sullivan aldrich story Mm -hmm. uh and then Mm -hmm. when we that's part of why that teleportation feels so jarring to me is just that i (laughs) hadn't thought about these things i hadn't thought about these characters in a while i didn't really need to i was you know i felt like i was part of a self kind of self-contained story and then shunted back to the the main story yeah Mm -hmm. um it's a great fight oh it's a wonderful fight go ahead Mm -hmm. i was just gonna say i felt like i needed some more estus flasks when that happened (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From gameplay yes. point of view, <laughs> I know Cole seems quite upset with the fact that you got teleported. I'd imagine that's a part of it. From oh, a gameplay mm. point of view, you just you beat one of the main four bosses of the game, you know, and then oh, you didn't need that Estus for this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it, it definitely does. I mean, you're probably going to be worse off. I just for for me, um, Aldrich was the uh, was the Lord of Cinder that I beat last. Um, mm. You know, prior to prior to coming here, and I definitely left Aldrich in worse shape than I left Yorm. Um, and the fight doesn't start right away. Um, thank goodness. But, um, you know, who would think to go, you know, even if you recognized, you know, how familiar this area is, who would think to go down to the, uh, to, to the Vort, uh, bonfire to save their mm-hmm. progress, you know? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, the nice thing is the dancer doesn't start off very aggressive. So if you need to homeward bone out, you can, mm, yeah. like if you've got a bunch mm. of souls or you need to refill your Estus, um, you know, she takes like a full t- 20 seconds or so to get in and get to you. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, which is one of the things I really like about this boss fight, and it's something I don't think we've seen explored in uh, Souls boss fights, is like slow grace (laughs) uh, like this. We'll we'll get that sometimes with caster characters. You know, you find somebody like um, the Fool's Idol, which is kind of graceful and has this slow sense of pacing, but we don't find melee fighters that are delicate No. uh, in this game. Mm. Everyone is so aggressive. Everything is so in your face and intense, and to have something that is kind of more lyrical and uh and gentle mm. and beautiful as a fight is really you know it it reminded me more of like it reminded me of like the moonlight butterfly or something like that yeah in uh in that mm. sense i really like that i appreciate that change of pace quite a bit it's one of those things where i'm always kind of on the lookout for things that justify the new generation of hardware and even though mm. we're you know three years into it now um but looking at this and thinking man oh man this fight is entirely about the animation Mm-hmm. Right. Like, you yeah. know, if you, you could take the hitboxes and hurt boxes and, you know, whatever, apply those. But like so much of this is actually sold in the intricacy of what they're kind of like able to do so quickly and so complexly uh, and mm-hmm. with such complexity um, with the way that she kind of attacks, because so much of it is these combos. Right. And, you know, by the time that she pulls out her separate dagger and, you know, starts doing the, these AOEs, it kind of becomes like a little bit more of a regular fight. But that that sense of flow never really goes away. I think mm. that's one of the best things a boss fight can do. It can sort of 
turn on your head something you've taken for granted the entire game. Uh, for example, with the dancer, I think the entire game you were going through and enemies were telegraphing attacks. There's like a pause and there's the attack. And you get good mm. at timing that invincibility frame around that. And then the dancer comes at you and she's just <laughs> telegraphing nonstop. Uh, there's never a telegraph and attack. There's just attack. And it's it sort of turns on its head, you know, a central gameplay aspect. That's what I like about it so much. It just yeah. felt so foreign in a way yeah yeah it, so, i mean in, in musical terms it would be like portamento yeah you know it'd be right. like it's hitting all the notes in between the two notes you're going to mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so it you know it doesn't have that kind of how to draw comics the marvel way <laughs> you know wind up and then uh, then release yeah. um i you know and i really it's not um it's not a boss fight i have tons of trouble with like it ends, it's one of the bosses fights that i think is in the easy kind of half of bosses in this game but i still really love because mm -hmm. it is that change of pace it's also an amazing set piece because when the kind of all the the trivia you know trivia videos came out and people were kind of just noting weird things about the game and they were you know like hey you can set parts of this church on fire um <laughs> the reason why is for this boss fight for in that second phase when like the church around you is burning down as this like graceful beautiful <laughs> thing is like setting fire to it like yeah. Mm. really really great stuff yeah you get yes. a sense of crescendo to the fight when you look yeah. around you at the end of it and there's like the entire place is on fire and then yeah. and then it's not on fire when you sit at the bonfire but, it, yeah. it kind it of looks... stretches credulity to say uh to, to say that everything catches on fire on fire is subtle but because it's not um kind of a uh um oh gosh giant spider lady uh it's not a quillog style right. like oh, area. yeah uh, it's not a quillog style um you know area denial kind of thing it's literally just cosmetic um and it just kind of happens as a result of her doing these long swoops with her uh with her fire sword um it really does like kind of build up without you noticing at least it, it did for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like the way fire spreads and the way fire moves is kind of like resembles a dance can be kind of uh you know graceful and smooth yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that way, like fire is a violent thing that is actually very beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, so it, it's, a this is, it's a, it's a very cool, it's a really great fight. Yeah. Like, uh, this is, and actually we're going to talk about three boss fights today and I like all three of them <laughs> Yeah. quite a bit. So, um, it is, it is a really good stretch for that. Uh, mm. as far as, as far as kind of like tactics and stuff, you just, you know, you learn her patterns and her spin goes on longer than you think it does. Right. And, uh, if you uh, can miss those first couple of attacks, she generally continues on a line, um, yeah. after those. Yeah. So, uh, have you ever tried to do it at a low level? No, because you uh, mentioned it was the easiest boss to you. I <laughs> disagree completely. Oh. <laughs> when you try doing it at soul level thirty, is it is uh, that is probably the hardest fight I've had in this game. Trying to get yeah, because I love getting a unique weapon early and then going through the game with that. So I wanted mm -hmm. access to you know the upper part of Lothric, and yeah. I love the fact that some Souls games have sequence breaks <laughs> in them. And I was glad it had one at least. Yeah, and I was dedicated to do that, but man, doing that at a low level, like it, it's it's absurd. You can't get hit by pretty much anything because yeah. it'll stun lock you. And, yeah. yeah, I, I know but myself it, better than to try. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never tried to fight her legit at a low level. I did the uh, the sword swordmaster glitch uh, mm. kind of thing, which uh, for those who don't know, I, didn't, uh, I remember the, hunting the have... for that at the time but yeah, yeah go on explain it i can't believe it's still in the game to be honest i i was i wasn't sure i was just gonna say i'm not sure uh, sure if it is there's a there's a way that you can uh summon the sword master for vort take him into the dancer and then if you die and come back and again the sword master ends up becoming invincible um and the sword master does he's leveled for vort so he does almost no damage to the dancer however his weapon has a huge bleed buildup yeah so you mm -hmm. just kind of hide in the corners and never get hit by anything while the Swordmaster bleeds out the dancer um, and gives mm -hmm. you access to all uh, the Consumed King's Garden and Lothric and everything very early, which is awesome because you end up with <laughs> Titanite chunks before you have even enough, you know, uh, uh, mm, shards. Shards, shards, you know, or large shards. Like you end up uh, being able to upgrade things pretty quickly and you can play with a couple weird end game weapons. Um, I did that and played with the claw for like a large portion of the game. Which you can get down mm -hmm. in the next area. Mm. Yeah. So. When you when you kill the dancer, you get her soul, which kind of gives all that stuff. One neat little thing that I just people would go crazy if we didn't mention. So her swords are a mirror of the pontiffs. Um, I forget <laughs> which is left and which is right, but uh, she holds the dark and fire swords in the opposite hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so it's hard to tell if this is the fight that they thought would work the best in a demonstration 
um, or if this is the one that they really, really worked to a polish and we're just kind of getting that benefit, um, you know, from wherever they put it in the game. But it's mm. kind of cool that it kind of like rests at this bottleneck kind of between the first two thirds and the last third of, uh, mm. of Dark Souls 3. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like they knew what they'd done when they made it a demo boss, though. And as soon as they did that, they probably yanked her out of there and said, we're going to have to... <laughs> they can't expect mm. this. We're going to teleport a whole lot of <laughs> the Aldrich fight, and we're going to throw him right in there. Yep. And he's going to be like, oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, on the topic of crescendos, and I felt like immediately after the boss fight ends was one of the most just bizarre, like sad lowbrow cutscenes I've ever seen. It's not particularly spectacular or cutscene worthy. It's just a ladder dropping, right? Yeah. Well, it's after you place the base. Spend development time on that. <laughs> yep. It's quite bizarre. It's it's like it's like a real like Resident Evil code Veronica uh, code Veronica kind of shot because you place the basin and the neck starts bleeding and it fills up. The, and then mm-hmm. just like you know, like they they literally just grab the you know the Z axis and they moved it. They they moved the altar back and then the ladder down. Um, just mm-hmm. kind of showing you, like, okay, well, now the way is up. It's like, well, I couldn't have gotten a hook like they had at a department store to get that down. <laughs> it is. I, you, you just uh, unlocked it for me. It's so Resident Evil. Yep. Like putting putting this basin down for like the statue to bleed into to make a ladder fall down. Like, <laughs> could have been in any Resident Evil game. <laughs> yep. Um, mm. um, this ladder takes us up to Lothric Castle, uh, which we'll actually be covering next episode, and we're going to take this little side path down to an optional area. Right. Um, here instead which is so if you continue going straight um, there are a lot of hard encounters and, and the like but if you go left uh, there are a lot of hard encounters as you head into the consumed king's garden yes here. and you pass uh, some holy smash on the way to, uh, to, to to an elevator they're back yep <laughs> down to this uh, kind of gigantic um, I love the way this area looks just because it is in a state of disrepair that kind of like implies a little bit more dignity than Farron's Keep does or did Mm -hmm. like it's you know it's still like a toxic swamp full of horrible monsters but like this is you know kind of on the earlier part of the curve Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well because it was originally a a captain kind of considered area right like yeah you get the sense of this being part of the castle you know going down to the godwood or going down to like the the kept kind of uh uh arboretum Mm -hmm. you know that you might have as part of your, your grounds tree place there we go (laughs) <laughs> um, you go down to Tree Place, and then it has just been so corrupted, uh, you know, by this, by this, you know, what's going on here, yeah. that it has become this mm. kind of thing. So it it is better, you know, it's not a naturally occurring area, <laughs> you know, it is it is something that was curated and then fell into disrepair, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and but, it's a uh, yeah. <laughs> but as you look out, you see, you know, just these pl- these pl- uh, pus of men walking around with their shame exposed to the world. Um, yeah, <laughs> rotten slug. Pass out, guns out. Yeah. <laughs> Pass out for her ammo. Uh, kill me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Shoot me in the face. <laughs> you got the slugs. Um, you have just kind of these red-eyed consumed king knights. Again, red eyes indicating something oh, to do with the abyss. Lines. Ooh, yeah, these slash lines are great. And Lothic priests just kind of, you know, just uh, acting like lifeguards in the pool over this toxic soup that makes up the majority of the uh, of the floor in this place. Hmm. The thing I found interesting the first time I went in was that the Cathedral Knights don't seem too perturbed that this place has fell into disrepair and there's pus of man walking around. They don't seem to mind it. But did you mention they're red-eyed? I didn't actually notice that they are. Are they? Yeah, I, I spotted them being are red-eyed. Are they all? Yeah. Oh, are they all red-eyed? Okay. Because when I, I first saw that, I thought... I don't know if all of them... Well, hold on, sorry. Just to clarify, I don't know if the, the Smashulon is. The Slashulon. Yeah, the Slashulon. Uh, are on. Yeah, yeah oh, and we're, okay. we're, we're using these terms like you just know what we're talking about, Bonnie. <laughs> Slash the one? <laughs> um, the, the mace knights, the cathedral knight, I don't think is red eye. The um, oh, the knights okay. that are down in the pool with the swords are, I believe. Mm. And there was one of those times where you sort of have to wonder, did they just not code those enemies to attack the bus of man? Because you'd think they'd be quite on opposite sides. You know, you've got a holy knight and you've got this like creature of the abyss. You'd think they'd be fighting one another. And I sort mm-hmm. of rationalized that by the item description, which says those cathedral knights are from the Cathedral of the Deep. Mm-hmm. And their set description actually says that they weren't set necessarily to fight against the, the creatures of the deep. They were set to fight against people who were foolish enough to come seeking them. So <laughs> I sort of rationalized that they were okay with those demonic creatures around because 
that's what they're like in the cathedral, right? They don't really care for that. They just care for the humans that come in seeking <laughs> to progress. Yeah. Mm. Or they could just be, maybe they just didn't code them to fight. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I really wish, I think this would have been more tactically um, interesting if they did fight them. Or not tactically interesting, but a little bit more kind if they would fight. Uh, because, I mean, mm. I already, I don't like fighting Puss of Man right. uh, very much in this game. I find <laughs> them really hard to read. And having yeah. a bunch of them on a toxic swamp where you have to fight multiple ones at once uh, just kind of ensures that this is an area I'm going to either cheese with ranged or run past the enemies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, like, I, I don't I do not like the fights down here very much on the way to the boss. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, no. I mean, I'll fight smash for days. I like smash -alons. and I've even come to come to, to enjoy slash -alons. But, but <laughs> you found room in your heart. I found room in my heart for the slash -alon. But um, consider the slash mm -hmm. the um, but the uh, the pusulons I cannot get into like and yeah. fighting multiple ones at once is a bridge too far for me. Yeah, this um, uh, I've never cleared this area out. Like I've never just kind of like, um, you know, let it ride and just be like, oh, I'm going to walk around here leisurely. No, this is this is a, a combat gauntlet and it's helped that this is a very brief area because of that. But like, you know, when you when you see that sight ahead of you as you go down the down the, down the elevator, I just I just kind of knew like, yep, I'm booking it. <laughs> yeah, but if you do that, you do actually miss out on summoning Hawkwood. Well, the chances are you would, because his um, yeah. his summon side is somewhere around there. It's kind and of I always the thought center. that was interesting because he he's related to something a little bit past Osiris, and I think the fact that his summon sign appears there is a neat little indicator of his journey <laughs> through the world, of his intention as his ultimate the, goals. Yeah, mm. yeah. Yeah, we're definitely when we get to the um, the Archdragon Peak, it's going to be fun to talk about that character because <laughs> they do a lot of interesting kind of. Uh, usually, when you summon a character in this game, um, sometimes they have a little bit of per like Dark Souls Two kind of started making them have a little bit of personality, but they don't have goals as summons. Mm. And uh, Hawkwood kind of bucks that trend and actually, you know, kind of has wants and goals and needs when you summon him in <laughs> in Archdragon Peak, and it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, um, actually, mm -hmm. the intersection of a multiplayer component you know, with the actual, uh, single player kind of storyline there. Um, here you can summon him. It's also, again, I, th I think we're going to a boss that I think is, is pretty easy. So I've, I've never had to summon, um, for this boss, but I could summon him just to help me clear it out because, yeah. you know, um, there's some interesting treasure that you can get if you do kind of clear this out and, and make <laughs> suicide runs for, through the muck. I, lo I <laughs> love, I love the story that this treasure tells actually. Mm -hmm. Um, because you can find the black set, um, and also some claws or sorry, no, the, the, the shadow set rather, um, both of which come from some kingdom to the East that just is, you know, just throwing, just throwing assassins at Lothric and the King of Lothric in specific, like they were just like tennis balls or darts or something, just like, ah, fuck it. Send like <laughs> 10 more. Um, like he's playing Warcraft one. Yep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just, just send, send all my units to yep. attack that general area. <laughs> and so, so many of them died in the swamp here. Um, and then you also find the dragon scale ring, which, uh, you know, is a superstition of Osiris's, which is like, oh, you know, this protects me from backstabs, um, implying that some of them were successful enough to try and stick a dagger in his back. And he's like, no, no, no. And then somehow very he weird... misplaced his ring outside his boss room. <laughs> yeah. It's his final mistake. That's probably why <laughs> <Yeah>. we win. <laughs> exactly. I stabbed him mostly in the back. He took it off uh, to wash I mean... his hands. Damn it. Or maybe he uh, turned into a dragon and just kind of pinged off his finger uh, as he grew. Oh, the alternative is is way worse. I didn't think about what it would be like to be wearing a ring and turn into one of these dragons, like and just having the metal like cut. It's <laughs> like when it. you see those pictures of turtles or something that you know, their shell grew around some piece of mm. metal. You know, or when that happens to a tree. Um That's a good boss concept later on. <laughs> yeah, well fantastic. Yeah, that's true. I I'm, I'm, I'm definitely into that. The um there's also a weird when you go up to get that dragon crest ring there's a weird shortcut to kind of a random spot in the middle of lothric castle um so if you go down here you can actually bypass a good chunk of going through lothric castle if you want mm -hmm. um it is it is an oddly placed shortcut though to kind of go through the swamp to get up there yeah. um not placed uh, near a bonfire or anything well the 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 real useful thing is it will actually uh so the the elevator up to kind of the uh the side door off of the elevator that you took down is a way to bypass the first part of the swamp and a lot of the pus of men so oh, like, yeah that's actually really useful for uh for boss runs if you end up being to take a couple of stabs at osiris mm -hmm. it is uh and i also i don't know if we're if we're saying that name right uh um, yeah 
Syrios. Um, I don't know. It looks Greek. I don't. I, 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 don't I go. Know. I go back and forth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's the safest option, right? I've done that a few times. Just say it both ways in the video. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Just uh, just say both and harmonize. Yeah, it's so it's like, like it's like they say in jazz. You know, if you play the wrong note, just play a bunch of other notes so people don't realize you play the wrong one. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> My one was Sullivan or Sullivan. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh so. man, you should you should read the comments we got for forgetting to pronounce the T in Aldrich. Um, that was. That <laughs> Do was you fun. have to pronounce it with a T. There is I no T in Aldrich. <laughs> or um, or for pronouncing it, um, one or the other. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. Um, if you are <laughs> leaving, uh, but for pronouncing uh, Aldrich or Aldrich or however uh, incorrectly people have been upset yeah people don't um, say their own names in these games <laughs> that's true yeah. and it's uh and even if uh you know even if the, it is it is said and you know you you read something out loud and you say it a bunch of times you say mm-hmm. it wrong yeah. i don't think it's a big deal yeah um <laughs> yeah so you get, get past this little kind of pool area to get down into this area where the actual boss is which of course we're talking about osiris or osiris uh the consumed king And this is uh, part of the small pantheon of boss fights in Souls games, um, Soulsborne games rather, uh, where the boss has dialogue. I, that's always gonna. I'm always gonna like that. That's ah, so good. Yeah. In this, and it, it's yeah, it's good dialogue too. And it nails the path, the pathos so much. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also like this voice actor a lot. Yeah. Um, I like it when a very dignified, uh, kind of proper voice comes out of a monster. Like I liked it with <laughs> with Aldia a lot. Um, and I like it here. It's kind of, uh, um, yeah. So this guy, what, what do we know about, uh, the consumed King? Uh, well, he, he's, he stands up from his hunch and he turns to look at you and he's, uh, he's very seethy. Um, he's kind of this, uh, very gaunt, uh, scaleless, uh, dragon with empty eye sockets, um, who is, uh, holding in one arm this, uh, uh, cr- or cradling rather, what appears to be an invisible baby or he's pretending to cradle something anything else um and in the other army kind of has this uh this walking stick so he's uh, he's kind of dual wielding these uh kind of like excuses not to hit like if, he, if you if he was wearing glasses <laughs> like he would just be you know he, he would be like, don't, yeah <laughs> yeah d- 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 <laughs> don't hit me the consumed king um but uh he very quickly goes on the aggressive in, in his other hand, he's got a little picture of like Jesus. <laughs> like, he's just holding, you know, just kind of like you can't, uh, you wouldn't, wouldn't do it with Jesus with glasses holding a baby, a baby Jesus. <laughs> so it's the ultimate thing you can't punch. <laughs> <laughs> the um, yeah, and his dialogue is here is, is really good. I probably cut it in uh, possibly near the beginning of the episode mm-hmm. because it's very good. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I'll cut it in here. But it is, uh, it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so. He, what, what, uh, buddy? What is, what is your take on this? Uh, so, so this baby, so Ocelot, hmm. uh, mm-hmm. a fan, you know, exists and it is invisible. Um, fragment of madness. Um, what is, what is your thought on that? Because hmm. those are the kind of two different ways I could see it going. Yeah, I think when the tough thing is establishing whether it exists and also whether it continues to exist after phase two of the fight, right? Right. Um, I remember hearing some cut dialogue in which he was actually supposed to eat the baby. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys have heard that. It's really gruesome. I, I haven't. Ugh. Right. But they, they clearly took that out, maybe because it was too gruesome or maybe because uh, they wanted to do this instead. And in phase two, he crushes this invisible baby thing yep. he's, onto he's... the ground. And then he goes into a real feral state. But for me, the baby kept crying after this. So mm-hmm. I think the audio cue of, cue of the baby crying is proof that, you know, it exists and it continues to exist after phase two, I believe, even though he seems to smash it down on the ground. Yeah. But I think the real question is, is this baby important? <laughs> and he seems to believe it is, right? But this is a madman who, you know, <laughs> abandoned everything in his kingdom. So how you don't have much to trust in Souls games, but usually it's the dialogue of the characters but when the character is insane it doesn't help a whole lot in establishing what a creature is but right. 
the the actual lack of, of being able to trust him is right there in his name. Like he, he's, <laughs> he's not like, he's not Osiris the reasonable king. <laughs> you know, he's not Osiris, Osiris the king who considers all options. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, some some more kind of uh, things here that I've at least seen about this. I haven't actually like. Um, look to proof the consensus is that there is actually like a geometry mesh that represents the baby um, um, us a lot um, and that, that it's just untextured um, so you can't see it um, and I've heard um, kind of conflicting reports about whether or not um, the baby continues to cry um, in the second right. phase um, and I've also heard conflicting reports about whether or not there is a splash of blood after Osiris kind of spikes him like he's about ready to do a, an end zone dance. Um, <laughs> hmm. So yeah, like that, 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 that's, that, that, that's just more to consider. I'm, I'm kind of of the mind that, you know, like I, I think it's, I, again, this is a gigantic ink block test. I would prefer to think that he just imagines that it's there. And we're mm-hmm. just party to his his madness in such a way that the audiovisual presentation of this, um, mm-hmm. you know, it presents us with uh, uh, the, w- w- with the crying. Even though, you know, we know that dragon half dragon people via you know Priscilla can be invisible. invisible. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I and mean, there, there's precedent Please. for hearing a baby cry, like a psychic baby cry in the yeah. series. That's <laughs> true. Um, we also have to consider even if it even if. It doesn't exist. He believes it does. So you have to question what was his motive in creating this thing. If you go with the crossbreed line, then you have to think of that description of Dark Souls 1 that mentions that crossbreeds, or one crossbreed in particular, has the power of life hunt and that the gods fear life hunt. Yeah. We don't know much about that, but mm-hmm. the fact that the gods fear it is interesting. Yeah. And I thought that maybe, you know, the fact that he met this baby and it says in the description he wanted to use his royal blood for a greater purpose well having a child along your bloodline is clearly a part of that so what is he is he you know against the gods in a sense does he just want this object of power i mean it so it like there's nothing really in lothric that implies that he that there is a desire to break the curse right so in dark souls 2 you know the emerald herald Shanelot, whose name is very similar to Ocelot, was explicitly a, or, you know, at at least very strongly implied to be the result of this experiment to try and break out of the cycle by, you know, combining humanity with dragon kind, right? She Mm -hmm. is, you know, she was raised by the dragons, you know, and she was kind of a failed experiment in some ways and, you know, kind of successful in others. And it depends on, you know, so many, so many factors that are just kind of half sketched. Nothing about the Lothric court or about, you know, this king implies that he's trying to kind of beat anything. If anything, mm. it, it, you know, this is his, his fascination with making a, a half breed dragon with his royal blood, which he probably or maybe assumed would be more compatible with dragons, um, mm. you know, was kind of the result of the influence of this grand archive and, you know, the influence of, you know, these big hat Logan and Seath worshippers kind of getting at him as he was losing his mind. But the timeline mm. is so unclear. Well, even if you don't think he bears any ill will towards Lothric, it's clear that they bear some ill will towards him, yeah. dispatching assassins for him. And I started thinking that maybe it's the fact that he's located where he is. And I wonder, considering the untended graves behind and the untended graves represent filing shrine in some sense, and filing shrine represents the linking of the fire, which Lothric <laughs> liked, uh, maybe his being there and guarding this place I wonder if that's an issue for the family. Yeah. If they, by somehow by losing access to this, they lost a degree of power. Yeah. Mm. And but then, you, yeah, you definitely can't rationalize any <laughs> hate from him towards anything or any objective, really. He just loves his little crossbreed. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, good. I, good. Or I was just going to say, if, if you hadn't brought up the idea of, uh, you know, creating this crossbreed to, um, to defeat the curse, I would have. But one of the interesting things about Dark Souls 3 is that um, it kind of, when we get to Arch Dragon Peak, it kind of zigs, like, the, the, the you know, to be a dragon. Uh, previous to this, that was the connotation we had. Mm-hmm. Um, and then 3 kind of leans into what previously, I feel like, was a PvP kind of gameplay consideration of dragons, which was that they dueled and they fought, and kind of changed them into these, almost these kind of monks, Mm-hmm. You know, this kind of uh, mm-hmm. this, this warrior path um, and would nary a mention of, of the curse. 
and how that actually relates. So it is, you know, what being a dragon means is harder for me to suss out and is more confusing in this game than previous entries in the series. Yeah. Dragons are like giants. Mm. Yeah, exactly. There's there's multiple kind of threads that lead to the same thing. Um, so as opposed to like, it, it just makes it more complicated. Like, it's not like there are different kinds of dragons, I don't think, without getting into serpents um, and those serpent <laughs> statues in Mothra. But it, it, it <laughs> Which does are become... just there smirking at me. Yeah, just, yeah, just, yeah uh, <laughs> but it, it does have this, I do have this sense that like, oh, like I really thought I had a handle on why people are trying to turn into dragons. But now, mm. you know, we have two different, we have uh, two different kind of factions. We have those half dragons below Irithyll. We have this half dragon here. Um, and then we also have the dragon monks. So again, mm-hmm. it, it, it kind of lends to that grander sense of me understanding things as an in individual aspects without really understanding how they relate to each other yeah. uh, in Dark Souls 3 frequently. Um, and this is like a big example of it where on, on a kind of a modular level in particular, I really like it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I love the voice acting. I like the idea of him. I mean, if he, you know, him losing, if he's actually holding the baby, the baby exists and then drops it and then can't, you know, loses it because he drops it. Mm-hmm. That is such a, like a, a great little moment of insanity. Yeah. You know, like him, mm-hmm. him having it, um, you know, or he's pretending to have it and it is that we can hear it. It's literally there. We can hear it crying, but it is invisible and he's, mm-hmm. you know, lost it both kind of in his <laughs> mind. And then also the baby, like all those things are really great as individual little bits of flavor. Like they're mm-hmm. very evocative and cool to me. Yeah. Um, without actually answering any questions. Yeah. Like on its mm-hmm. own as a story about grief and obsession and madness, this works, you know, again, yeah. kind of like the, kind of like the, 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 the dancer, like, you know, the, this definitely has connections to other things. We can't suss out what it is, but at least on the intra level, we can, we can be satisfied with what's presented mm-hmm. here. Yeah. I need, I need to look up that cut dialogue. Cause I, I hadn't seen, um, I've seen somebody link a picture that was supposed to be the mesh, but it didn't look like anything right. to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I have not found the the cut dialogue or sound effects, so I have to find that and I'll put it in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Um, There's not much. I wouldn't call it dialogue. It's more, I believe, just screaming and <laughs> eating and stuff. So don't screaming. get too not, not, just, not just boss fight monster noises. <laughs> chewing, chewing, not, chewing sounds. Really close, yeah. close <laughs> caption. Oh, that's good, baby. Yeah, no, yes. that's yeah. No, that's uh, that. That seems a little bit too edgy for me, honestly. The like that that, oh, that they I, would go for it. I'm pretty glad. I'm glad they they didn't have him consume his baby. Yeah, like that. That's a little bit much to me. I mean, all the umbilical cords you're eating in Bloodborne was like that, that's a little bit Silent <laughs> Hill know. for me, and then this would be a, like like a little bit too too Silent Hill for me. Mm-hmm. But smashing it on the ground's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, you, you found line, the pres- you know? <laughs> yeah. Boom goes the dynamite. <laughs> The, the precise line I won't cross. Really. <laughs> exactly. Just uh, quantize my morality down to a, <laughs> to a single uh, single point. Whew, man, um, the, uh, the 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 temperature is relatively comfortable here. Well, that's why. <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as uh, this guy's background too, before we talk about the fight a little bit. Um, so when he decided he wanted to do something with his royal bloodline, he got kind of obsessed with this, uh, with with doing something with that, and he turned to the uh, the people in the Grand Archives, and they turned him on to worshiping Seath. Seethism. Uh, yeah, Seethism. Seether is neither, uh, <laughs> big nor small. And the um, so that is why he recalls Seeth so much. Right. Um, and he has, you know, this his soul is where you get the Moonlight Sword, where you get the uh, the White Dragon Breath. Um, you get your Seeth Miracles. He has our Seeth stand-in uh, for mm-hmm. this game. And it's interesting um, the fact that they they felt the need to put a Seeth stand-in in, right? And you have to wonder what is the the meaning of that in just a story sense. Is, it does, is, is there always supposed to be someone who fits the role of Seath? Like, did this was this just a regular dude who fell into this by chance, or is this a guy who actually had Seath's soul all along mm-hmm. and then naturally went down this path? Or is there some fate involved where there always has to be a blue crazy dragon? <laughs> we, we, had, we had so many conversations in, in Dark Souls 2 about kind of the agency that Seath's soul has as a kind of m- move from host to host. Um, mm-hmm. via exactly, Seldora yeah. and about, you know, kind of controlling Freya and, you know, or just kind of like being in the, you know, just kind of, kind of influencing all of the proceedings there. Like it doesn't seem beyond, you know, just be beyond credibility for me to, to, to think that, oh, it just found its way here. And, you know, we found a very willing and good host that could help can continue the research, you know, or mm-hmm. at least benefit from it or protect the research or any of those things. 
Mm. I mean, it also I, raises the question, is the Queen of Lothric, does she operate by those same rules? Is it actually Guinevere or is it somebody who takes after her in the same sense that Osiris takes after Seath? Oh, Uncle yeah. Seath. <laughs> <laughs> it is, I mean, it, it's a good question, though, because it, it takes, uh, it's a different kind of callback than the other callbacks that we've had in the game. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like there is a, uh, you know, all of the Lord Souls are necessarily represented the same way that they were in in dark souls 2 um the callbacks in, in dark souls 3 are you know kind of take a different form than that but to have something that is this is the first boss that is explicitly other than than uh you know the the gwendolyn uh aldrich thing um where this is explicitly you know that same character kind of reborn um it is an anomaly so that's a really good question uh and i i don't know um i do like the idea that like Seath actually having this thing where there is kind of always a Seath because of that insatiable curiosity. And it plays into that like real Lovecrafty kind of Bloodborne yeah. thing where it is, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that happens to you when you start uncovering this, this dark knowledge. Like yeah. the entirety of the theming around Seath is about that, is about the danger of pursuing knowledge. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And this is kind of the expression of that in this game where Osiris, you know, uh, attempted to like essentially no matter what, you know, whether Ocelot exists or not, uh, I don't think it's a happy story. <laughs> you know, whether, uh, you know, Ocelot gets spiked or eaten or uh, was because we know Ocelot was born at some point because of because of item descriptions. Um, so is dead or is having, you know, a pretty rough life. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a grand sacrifice, if anything. And to use your own offspring in pursuit of kind of black science um, mm -hmm. is as seeth as you get. You know, that's uh, yeah. like that's that's been been on the page for the entire series yeah mm -hmm. so um can we let's uh, talk about the fight real quick yeah we really uh, we, should <laughs> yeah which is i mean there's not too much to this it it feels like a bloodborne fight mm -hmm. to me um just mm -hmm. in that he it's mostly a you know once he especially the second phase when he gets kind of bipedal and gets real chargy and spinny mm -hmm. um you know there's there's not a lot to it yeah i think the biggest thing that uh that osiris has working for him um is that he can kind of attack from a wide uh at a wide range kind of from out of nowhere um mm -hmm. via his uh his kind of tailspin or his uh um kind of like tail whip kind of thing like that got me like it just i had trouble with osiris this time whereas i didn't before via some vagary of my build or you know just whatever what have you um and also the idea that he you know kind of in the first phase, definitely, but especially in the second phase, does these jumps that for me broke my lock on. Um, that was mm. actually kind of, kind of a little bit frustrating, actually. I never want my lock on broke, yeah. and like whenever that always feels like an intersection of the you know the the game world and the mechanics in a way that feels kind of gross. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I mentioned uh, before that the best thing a boss fight can do is sort of take something you've taken for granted and get rid of it. But I feel like you should just never touch a player's camera, right? <laughs> like no matter how good your reasoning is, you know, Oh, it's dark. You can't lock on. It's like, don't do it. Don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't break my the, lock um, on. That, um, that jumping attack, uh, on the, the wiki, he has two attacks called bonk and leap bonk, which is when he <laughs> hits you on the head with his, uh, his staff. So you might be talking about the leap bonk that he does, right. which is my favorite TurboGrafx-16 launch game. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't think there's too much to this guy, though. Like, a lot of times I feel like his hitboxes are kind of broken where mm -hmm. I will just kind of be under him and I'll feel like I probably mm -hmm. should have gotten hit, but I don't. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I just kind of wail on him until he dies. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, I've I've never had a problem with this guy. Yeah. It definitely, no matter how easily you dispatch him, it always feels like it's not it's not a clean boss fight. You know, you're always missing a lot of attacks, and he's missing a lot of attacks. And maybe yeah. they just felt like capturing that. You know, yeah. that it's just a cluster. And it's not. It's a bit of madness in the mechanics as well. Yeah, sure. I also like that he doesn't really resort to using his crystal breath until he goes entirely feral. Um, mm -hmm. after that, like that, like that doesn't really come out. He has like a, like a little AOE that he does with his staff, but like he doesn't use his breath weapon until he's down on, you know, down on all fours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he wouldn't want to catch a Ocelot in it. <laughs> True. So he's, got, he's got a, you know, got to get rid of that <laughs> and he can, he can breathe yeah. freely. Yeah. Um, the, the, yeah. So, so like the, this definitely feels mechanically a little bit like a Bloodborne fight, but I think that like 
presentationally this this is like a you know like a demons and dark kind of uh tarnished dignity kind of thing like yes. this is a king you know and like this is probably like minus Alant, one of the sorriest states we've ever found a king in well, I mm-hmm. guess Vendrick too. No, like no king ever gets out unscathed. <laughs> Fuck, no. Forget it. Forget I said anything. <laughs> well, no. I mean, you're right. It, this is this is a good expression of that quiet dignity, yeah. kind of thing in a boss fight, which is you know not always, uh, you know, can can kind of be can be lacking in this game. I think, yeah. um, depending on the character. But this one, this guy definitely has it. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. This little bit. So he is pursuing dragonism, as we definitely find out from going in this little area after we beat him. Um, again, for reasons that don't line up with why Hawkwood is pursuing dragonism or what mm-hmm. we understand about dragonism that comes later, but it is such a weird little shift to go into his little, uh, I don't mm-hmm. even know what you would call this little hallway that goes down here, his little, little like shrine or anti-chamber little anti-chamber type thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. His little man cave, like kind of zone here, um, where we get, um, the, uh, the path of the path of the dragon gesture. Um, there's a little guy, uh, sitting, you know, in a kind of little yoga pose, um, <laughs> in, in one of the, you know, I think that probably the best hidden area, you know, and by most hidden is what I mean. Um, you know, which we eventually will get to our dragon peak because we've never had to use a gesture, uh, to do something like that other than curling into an egg. Hmm. Um, and, uh, we were into a little bit of foreshadowing here with the serpent man yeah. that's down here. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the real thing is finding this uh, kind of double illusory, you know, we're behind a boss, but we find an illusory wall <laughs> behind it. I mean, a treasure chest that brings us to kind of the, the focus of this episode. And the, and the big question marks is the untended graves. Yeah. And like I said at the beginning, we we stumble right into this. Like we just kind of fall into what appears to be kind of this abyssal valley. You know, the abyss, if we, as we've seen it expressed in previous games, be it, um, you know, in Dark Souls 2 when we were doing the like the, the dark diving or in Artorias of the Abyss, like everything's kind of drained of color. It's these mm-hmm. kind of ashen walls, um, you know, very dark, just kind of nothing, nothing really uh, by way of texture or anything like that. But man, I assume this hit everybody kind of the same, right? When you mm-hmm. when you stepped out to that crossroads and looked to the left and you saw the tree, and you looked to the right and you saw the uh, like the the bowl and the vessel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, well, it's intended, obviously, to make you question all your premises that you had before. Yeah. Right. Like you question what, wait, why am I in Filing Shrine? Why is this place here? And how is there two of them? How is there a dark one? And then later on, you question, why is there three now? <laughs> so it's one of those things. So it wants you to almost go lore hunting in this area. But mm-hmm. as people will discover as we stumble through figuring out the story of this place, it's not easy necessarily no. to do that, even though they clearly expect it of you. <laughs> it, it, it's an amazing moment of kind of shock. Like yeah. I think that in looking back, mm. you know, my third time through the game and, and kind of spending the season talking about it, um, you know, probably my favorite moment mm-hmm. in the game was, was figuring this out. And I didn't end up looking over to the bowl um, right away. So my kind of, uh, I, this is, you know, kind of embarrassing. I'm, you know, being a little slow on the uptake where I didn't see the bowl. I didn't realize this was the same area until I walked over to where the Corvians were um mm. fought them off and then there was a coffin here and i was like oh that's familiar you know that can't be <laughs> and then i clicked on a soapstone that said uh could it be you and i'm like oh shit <laughs> like it was that's a really perfect. really great moment like and i mean i would have figured it out of course yeah but i just i had that and it it is like i said it is the best i don't have an answer for it like it is kind of the part of me that wants the the story to to have all of its parts, you know, to, to know exactly what's going on is unsatisfied. The part of me that values unpredictability um, and messing with my expectations was just delighted. Mm. Um, you know, I just like, what does that mean? Like that is bonkers. <laughs> um, and just like my jaw was, was dropped, you know, for this entire stretch, uh, you know, up through the entire thing. And it does like, like my body said, is it does make you, question like if the kind of person who's going through these games because i i've seen online where i'll I'll look at people who do videos and it's about uh uh, boss strategies or kind of trivia things and there are people who are not concerned with the story of these games at all um even those people have to kind of pause and wonder why this is happening (laughs) it's like a question that demands to be considered yeah um where you can safely ignore a lot of questions leading up to this point if you're of that mindset but this (laughs) this i feel like just kind of grabs you by the lapels and says like no 
Something <laughs> is happening. Look closer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, could it be you? <laughs> um, There's someone in the coffin too. You yeah, know, with their hand outstretched. That's the that's the scary thing, right? <laughs> yeah, it's so it's the hand outstretched with the uh, with the ashen ring, um, or the ashen Estus ring rather. Uh, which... it, I thought that was in the uh, in the. Is that there or is that in the the basin? Oh, the the, the, the... Cor- the Corvians were guarding it. Like it's oh, okay, gotcha. yeah yeah. Uh, the 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 Estus ring was uh, not the Estus ring. Um, the the ashen Estus flask was on the uh, was at the basin. But the, exactly yeah. yeah. But the ashen Estus ring, like the Queen of Lothric put it here like to help the chosen undead or the or, or the unkindled one rather mm. yeah which has it also mentions that she was the only one to sort of care for the people in this place right which i yeah. thought was interesting because there are quite a lot of links between lothric and filing shrine i mean you have a high priestess sitting in there there's <laughs> a giant throne that says it has lothric's name on it <laughs> um uh, but and there's also the Estus ring which actually further on which says that a story that came out of this place became a favorite tale of the masses Mm -hmm. so this place is known you know outside of where it is and um but the queen's the only one who really cared and i'm sure yeah can sort of understand why yeah and you know it would make sense that this this version of it is is the only one where we really see direct mention of the queen because this is you know at least the way we experience it physically connected to lothric Whereas the uh, cemetery of ash and the fire link that we that we encounter uh, at the beginning prime. of the game, yeah, fire link prime. There we go. This is going to get very confusing otherwise. Fire link prime is kind of mm. separated. You teleport in and out. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. And yet, so, and yet, when you're in fire link shrine, you can still see the giant Lothric castle there. And if you yes. use a few cheats, you can actually fly into it, and mm-hmm. you know it loads normally. And then you go back, and you're in your, you're in the dark one. So these places actually occupy exactly the same space down to the um, point where sh- if you if you die your blood stain mm. if you die in the dark one your blood stain is visible and recoverable in the light one mm-hmm. yeah if I'd- you die in the game you die in real life <laughs> the um yeah. and and soapstone messages will will be in both worlds right um mm. yeah it it is a uh, it is a trip <laughs> uh, the uh and it it part of me is you know trying to figure out where this is which is the the thing once we kind of describe what's here is what we're going to ask questions about and discuss, I guess, um, is so confused by a lot of things like this being, you know, the continuity, the fact that you stumble into this rather than go through a portal or go through a fog gate or get Mm. teleported or anything like that really confuses things for me. It implies that Um, it's canonical. It implies that's canonical, which Mm. makes you question, uh, you know, the Firelink prime and whether that is in is canonical. You know, as opposed to this, however, why is only one part of the world post collapse or post darkness <laughs> or, pr- or, or 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 pre, you know, like pre disparity, like, you know, st- like in this in the ebb, a part of the ebb and flow of the fire. Like, you know, when you when you roll up to fire link here, you know, the the, the trine handmaid is there. And she's like, oh, I didn't hear the bell ring and the fire's not on. What are you doing here? Yeah. Mm. You know? So it's it, that's you know, another post- Sorry. Or go, go ahead. That's another thing that's interesting is that she mentions the bell hasn't rung. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned that mm-hmm. this place is canonical, and I thought that too for a long time. I thought, oh, that means the untended grave is literally connected to the rest of the world, and maybe <laughs> our filing shrine is a dimension, uh, sort of like the hunter's dream from Bloodborne. Mm-hmm. But then that you think about some things that fly in the face of that, like the fact that the, sh- the dark shrine hand maiden didn't hear the bell ring, which is there's, mm-hmm. there's nary a peep from the bell. But there are characters in Lothric and the rest of the overworld that this dark shrine is connected to that did hear the bell ring. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Grey Rat, for example, says uh, that, you know, he, he heard the bell. Like, that's why you're here, right? From the bell mm-hmm. ringing. You're some of that unkindled ash. So while it's connected by space, I think this play, it's not canonical with the rest yeah. of the world in that sense <laughs> is yeah. It, yeah is this prior to the current cycle that we're in is it a different cycle altogether that we're kind is of like it, giving a peek alternate. into yeah yeah or an, or an alternate that's the other thing i've read a lot is, is like an alternate dimension and the the thing is is that there is conflicting information it's right. not you know what you were saying where it's like you think that this way because it is connected it's canonical because you can walk to it mm-hmm. uh which is something that mm-hmm. we trust um, even if space is kind of spacey wacy in this game, we still, you know, I was here and now I'm here. These areas are connected. Um, you mm-hmm. run into things that just strongly suggest that this is the past as well. You know, that this mm-hmm. is before the current cycle and not an alternate dimension where 
you run into things with the uh, the not the fire keeper, the handmaiden who's here who will remember you mm-hmm. uh, in mm-hmm. the in the you know if, in Firelink Prime, or you run into Gundir, which we'll talk about, and yeah. how what his encounter here makes sense as something that would happen before mm-hmm. the our first encounter with him. Right. Um, so it is just there's a there's contradictory stuff. You know, it doesn't. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. have an explanation that you know actually squares everything together um which makes it like a really fascinating question and an amazing moment but i don't i don't have an answer for it you know um Mm. yeah i mean and i know we talked about it off air and a little bit in the beginning of the episode that like i think they're all on the same page there as far as not having something concrete but does that i mean has that been your experience in kind of trying to figure it out or research it as well um that it is uh contradictory it definitely is contradictory, especially when you talk about time. Um, there are some, that I think the great majority of things in this place indicate that it is in the past, but I also get the impression that it's sort of lost to time in a sense. Uh, one description I came across was really unrelated. It's the um, it's one of the oldest soul miracles. I can't remember which exactly. Mm. Maybe Wall of Light, the one that protects you from uh, projectiles. And it says that light is time. And the reversal of its effects is in a forbidden art. And I thought that was interesting because this is a dark place. So does the absence of light mean the absence of time in this world? Mm. Is time, because this isn't just a place in the past. I think it's also a place that's sort of lost to time. It doesn't really have a future. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, everything in here seems like it's yeah. at the end of its its rope. Yeah, it's, um, it's unmoored or kind of in stasis or adrift. Mm. Yeah, I think most things do point towards it being in the past, though. Yeah. Uh, you have you have a shrine handmaid who recognizes you if you talk to her in the dark shrine before mm-hmm. the yeah. light shrine. Um, you have Gundir. Yeah. You have Ludleth who references this actual dark place. Right. So and 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 you know the kind of references what you find here at the at the end of this specifically with 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 Gundir, and I don't want to burn too much of that too much of that discussion um you know there's a little bit to imply that it's almost like an artorius kind of thing where we are the champion that killed him after he arrived yes. late you, you know <laughs> like like this is th- this is between cycles he arrived to this too late to kind of like save and rekindle it we're going to wait for the next go around and he is kind of, you know, you know, kind of enlisted as this kind of eternal, you know, first champion. Um, but then this, you know, this judge as he is linked to it and, and kind of pinned to it as the sheath. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Do we want to talk it's about a... Gundir or should we talk about <laughs> uh, it a bit more? It's so it's, that's the hardest thing with this episode. I don't know if we mentioned no, it, it's... but <laughs> by virtue of talking about the start of it, you kind of have to talk about the very end as well. Yeah. I'm willing let's, to jump um... right into talking about Gundir, maybe. Let's um yeah let's move just say just say real quick you know that on you know on your way here everything more or less matches right um the enemies are a little bit harder there are a few more of them um there's an invader that can happen uh, this daughter of mm-hmm. Crystal Crimehild um who is related to the the archives yeah uh, they're you know an enemy that we find in the archives uh Black Hand uh, Gothard um there. Yeah. And, we, and while she's we, a very nondescript, nondescript enemy, she is mm-hmm. interesting by the virtue of the fact that I'm pretty sure she's wearing the Firekeeper garb. Mm-hmm. Did you notice that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the Firekeeper garb is reserved for those who cherish the searing darkness. And it's also given to people who are, and it says, Guardian of the Shrine. It's one of those sets that actually references, you know, what the wearer is supposed to be. And I thought that mm-hmm. that wording was interesting. Guardian of the Shrine. Right, yeah. because when you think yeah. guardian, you don't think of the firekeeper who's passively in the shrine helping you. She's a, an assistant, you know. She's there to serve you. I don't think that fits the word guardian, which sort of guardian of a physical space. And this this firekeeper, Krimheld, if she is a firekeeper, she's actually invading and doing a much more active role of guarding, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah. So she she could have some links there. Uh, she seems to have taken on that role. But it's another one where you could explain her being there in so many different ways you know is she invading so she can get humanity because that's what firekeepers like too or (laughs) is she just invading here because um she's a shade of the past or is she actively invading it's very hard to know yeah like is she is she sent you know by this current iteration of the grand archives that sits above lothric you know kind Mm. of like as an agent um you know there's precedent for that kind of activity too you know yeah. places with one interest in another place um sending their agents over yeah 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 
Um, once you make your way past here, and there's the, all the same stuff from that first thing. There's the double crystal, uh, or there's double crystal lizard here, giant crystal lizard. Uh, you make your way uh, actually to this boss fight, to champion Gundir. who kind of strikes a very similar profile uh, to Udex Gundir, you know, where he is in the middle, except you're not coming up and pulling out a sword. You're just walking up and he gets up ready to kick. Yeah, like he's sitting down eating a Lunchable. Like, you know, he's just taking a load off. <laughs> Udex um, Lunchable. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the yeah, Lunchable that judges all of their Lunchables. Yeah, he was using his helper. You shall be uploaded. You shall not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he kind of, I, I love that animation as he uses his halberd as like a, um, a prop to get up almost it's kind of like mm-hmm. ah it's a living and then he gets up and he just he comes at you with everything he's got mm. yeah i i think this the is game, a great the, fight too sorry to keep saying that but like i, I love the, this fight hmm. well the, the game's kind of geared you to expect him to be a bit of a pushover right he was the <laughs> tutorial boss but then he flies at you uses way more moves than any other thing you've seen before he has, his moveset is actually one of the most diverse i think oh yeah mm-hmm. Um, it's it's a little bit bloodborne in that you know it feels like they're explicitly trying to keep you out from behind him. Um, he's he's you know more aggressive than anything that I've seen in the game so far, um, and he's got you know by virtue of the fact that he has this halberd and he's doing these large sweeps, and then he also has this like kind of donkey kick out behind him um, mm-hmm. to kind of like knock you away. Like he very much is trying to keep you from getting up in his guts. You know, like he wants yeah. you. He wants you at a distance where he can kind of set you up with a combo and then do his grab and then, you know, crush your skull in his hand like it was an apple. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, like you do with apples. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just smash them. Yeah. That's and how I he makes sauce. my palms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, he's got, a, he's got a wide set of moves, which I'm not, you know, that's not my favorite thing in, in bosses. It's something I usually look for, but they're all pretty fair and his uh, parry windows are all feel really good. Yeah. Uh, he feels you know, like he's it, designed for parrying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's easy to tell what can be parried and what cannot, um, and I didn't have that thing that sometimes happens with bosses where like, oh, that really seems like I should have got that, and I, I didn't, and the consequences for failure are being comboed to death. You know, it mm-hmm. feels like a very fair fight to me. Um, yeah, and I don't. Definitely. He doesn't turn into a puzzle man. He doesn't turn into a camera nightmare. <laughs> no. So, um, <laughs> so 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 I, I love this because in the first iteration, you know, he's he's obviously got this thing growing on his back. And now with this new context, again, this repetition giving you details by comparison, um, you know, when we, when we first saw him, he was, he was mindless, right? Like, that's why the first part was so easy, and that's why, you know, they kind of were trying to teach you about phase changes in the most obvious way possible by having this, you know, turd dragon erupt out of his back. Here, this is Gunder kind of at the height of his power, almost, mm-hmm. and... Like it reminds me of Flame Lurker a little bit, insofar mm-hmm. as you know, as he's whittled down, he doesn't slow down. He doesn't necessarily have, you know, he doesn't unlock a complete new move set. There are a couple of subtle things that change. He just gets faster and angrier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm. it's so yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's a really, it's a really good fight. Um, you know, and I, I'm always going to be drawn to duels in these games with you know characters with at least, you know, kind of comparable movesets to what I have, um, you know, and that are easy to read, yeah. you know, like I can, I, I know where his body parts are when they're, they're at places. Yeah. Like some of the swings are a little bit wider than I expect them to be, but that's easy enough to learn. Um, but you like the idea real- in games that a boss is operating on the same sort of rules that you are in a sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he's missing the rule that says don't attack, don't stop attacking ever. <laughs> Cause you know, <laughs> you're generally stamina. Yeah. But, it's, it's fun from a dueling perspective, right? Like, I always enjoyed human boss fights a lot more than monsters, mm-hmm. uh, for the most part, just because of that mm-hmm. rule. I, yeah. I I think the first time I fought him, I had a little bit of some trouble with kind of unlimited stamina. But this last time, um, I kind of unlocked a way of fighting him that reminded me of my kind of backwards way I fought uh, Orphan of Coast, which was you know, hit and runs, you know, like not getting in more than one hit, kind of just doing a couple of dodges, hitting, moving out of the way. 
uh, that really worked for me. I understand that's not the most efficient way of fighting either of those bosses, but it ended up kind of ameliorating the unlimited stamina thing, which is something that does mm. frustrate me. Like that's something that, you know, I end up getting, I got irritated at with the, um, the, the, the pontiff. pontiff. Yeah. The, the well, pontiff and also the pontiff like priest and, and his agents in Irithel, like that was a problem for those regular enemies. With the boss, I just kind of, it didn't end up affecting me this last time, which could have been, you know, a roll of the dice, obviously. Like, could have been the RNG just was favorable uh, for me. But I, I'm not as bothered by that as you are, I don't think. And it doesn't really throw me off here because this is, again, you know, crescendo, right? He starts off kind of at a reasonable pace, and it's not like there are kind of uh, jerks to plateaus, you know, like mm-hmm. it's not like, oh, now he's suddenly faster. That may be the case, but the perception that I have is like he's very slowly raising you up. And like, I, you know, just a successful run against this guy is one where I kind of like raise my pace to match his. Mm. That's an yeah. interesting point. It also matches, you know, who he is in a sense. He's a tutorial boss that you fight three times and each time he does get progressively mm-hmm. harder. So he's as, you know, by virtue of being a tutorial boss, I think he teaches you his moveset well. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I think when you beat this boss, it's because you knew pretty much every one of his moves and you knew where the frames were to dodge them. And he's been teaching you that at the very start of the game. And then he starts off at a medium pace when you fight champion Gundir. And then he lets loose at the end. And that feels good because you're actually learning alongside it. Yeah. And yeah. he is a judge, right? So <laughs> yeah. he's trying to get you up to There's nothing of not fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, right. No. So, so this is a guy, um, so he was a champion prior to this, uh, <laughs> who arrived late, you know, uh, that, you know, the fire would not light, the bell would not toll and, uh, was kind of here. We came along and killed him. Uh, and eventually, uh, that caused him to be a judge that <laughs> would judge people before they were able to enter Firelink and presumably do what we are doing in the game. Right. Um, mm. you know, we kind of put him in that spot. <laughs> it's kind of implied. Yeah, and it's mm, it's real so. dismal too because you know he's he's dead. He acts as a sheath for this coiled sword, you know that ultimately is used to to, to reignite things. The sense that I get is that we kill him and then just like his body is arranged, you know, by somebody who comes after and kind of sets it, you know, just set, sets in sets in place all of this eternal machinery. You know, he's bound to this by his, when he wears a, a a chain link as a ring, um, and that 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 sprite is mm. actually uh, pulled from. Uh, oh yeah. gosh, the uh, the ring of the embedded from Dark Souls mm-hmm. Two. Um, so there's you know kind of that as well. Um, again, somebody being put into bondage like this. Um, and there's even like a little wry aside in his in his weapon, which says, "Oh, it's incredibly durable, as though you know it's it, it was made to last for all eternity." Maybe he was meant for this from the start. Hmm. Yeah, I also like that connection with the embedded. They're both characters as well that were punctured with a sword in some capacity, right? Yeah. I think there's mm-hmm. a lot of parallels to be drawn there. Although there's no parallels in terms of, you know, I don't think there's actually any meaningful. Yeah. It's more of an Easter egg than anything because <laughs> the embedded was a, you know, a slave to pleasure. And Udex Gundir is like someone who's pretty much the antithesis of that. <laughs> Very he just as- missed as- his morning alarm yeah. and, you know, paid the price. <laughs> Different yeah. character entirely. Yeah. Uh, Gundir uh, Gunder knows how to party. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> yeah, he, he's, a, he's a slave to pleasure. You just got to, you just got to put on, uh, put on the right tunes um he can get down he's, he's doing those kicks it's like when elaine dances in seinfeld um, good the, seinfeld um, pull oh th- thanks bud yeah i'm 36 um the, <laughs> I, so, I knew exactly what you meant it's yeah, no, right. second like time remember i just oh that's true <laughs> um yeah um so when, when you beat him uh we do the you know i here's the thing i was at and i don't know if you guys had this thought i thought how much of the game is going to continue from here? Yeah. Like, mm. am I going to go into dark Lothric and then dark Irithil <laughs> and then dark, you know, and just kind of continue? Oh, and this is the, cool. I almost wish I, they I was, did that now. Me, me too. <laughs> I, I was just, I, I didn't know how long this would keep going because it, if it was just Gundir, I was like, okay, that kind of wraps up Gundir. But then when that door opened and I just saw Firelink, I was like, wow, <laughs> like I am in, I'm in like the, the anti-universe, you know, mm-hmm. of this. And like, yeah. am I going to go through all the different areas and see what they were like before this happened? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm like, oh, this is going to give me the story of how Pontiff found the flame and like yeah. all that stuff's going to be in the middle of that. And then that just didn't happen. You know, I'm going to see um, what the world looks like when yeah. the flame is out. Yeah. Yeah. What, what was that, uh, buddy? You're definitely disappointed 
probably by all the mm. ladders they'd withdrawn further on. You can't even go <laughs> up into the tower. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I want to see if those bodies are still there. Come on. Yeah. I like that concept, mm-hmm. though, the idea that you could be going through a nightmare, like a hard mode of the game, right? Mm-hmm. Like, imagine if you triggered the darkness and then you went through the back rest of the game and there's just <laughs> black knights everywhere, and that would be cool. Oh, yeah. The black knights, they're creatures that they're in two places mainly, right? They're in places of chaos, and then they're also in the dark filing shrine. Um, and I think that's, you know, related to what their sets describe in Dark Souls 1, which was that, A, they fought against the demons, so they mm-hmm. appear in Isolith as well, and then they also linked the fire with with Gwyn, or they went with him, and um, I think that explains why they're appearing in a in a kiln, mm-hmm. and also just generally that they're wanderers, and that explains why we find them throughout the world. Mm-hmm. It kind of mm-hmm. gives them the sense of eternity, you know. Is yeah. that like we we? It was a little bit strange when they showed up in the main game outside of demons, like the one that's in Farron's Keep is a little bit weird to me. Um, but the fact that they're here, which is presumably chronologically beforehand just kind of like these things will never die because they're, you know, heavily implied just to be animate suits of armor with the, you mm-hmm. know, the inside they've been burned up. So of course they're going to kind of walk eternally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here. I think one of the descriptions um, mentions that they actually were burnt to ash and mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. shrine being a place of ash and unkindled ashes yeah. is I think pretty relevant. That's one thing that when I saw myself in the, in the coffin, uh, like you did, I started thinking about the opening cutscene in particular. I wonder if that it was, I thought it was maybe intended to sort of bring you back to your roots and your beginning and question that um, mm-hmm. to a big degree. And the opening cutscene is of something, there's a lot in there you take for granted, I think. Um, for one, there's two lords you don't see rise from their, their graves, right? There's Ludleth, who's apparently a lord, and there's also Lothric, who you never see rise. And I think that's interesting, and maybe we can talk about that as we go into the actual shrine itself. But the other thing is that you see the actual, can I spoil the final boss in this podcast? I assume so. Yeah. Uh, You see the, the, right. You see the soul of Cinder and he's dragging this, this undead and you see him sort of incinerate them or plunge something within them. And I think that, that, that's a part of our beginnings, right? Linking the fire Mm. and being turned into ash is what the unkindled is. They're not really undead. They're more like, they're sort of a new being, in mm-hmm. my opinion. Something that's created from the cycle, not just a part of the cycle. Yeah. It's like an un- unintended byproduct. And whenever mm-hmm. I think of Ash, I always think of of that. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. I, I yep. personally think that when you finish the game and you fight against the Lord or the Soul of Cinder, um, if you fail, or, or all the undead who fail are probably burned by him for the flame, right? Uh that explains why there's such a multitude of graves around, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That maybe. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. And I just wanted to bring us back to the opening cutscene and bear that in mind as we go through this place because it's so intrinsically linked to the shrine. So much of the game revolves around the shrine. You yeah. can see the firekeeper put on her crown, presumably, uh, for her first time putting that on. Yeah. Just, yeah. In the intro. Yeah. I just, mm-hmm. I just, I just get the sense that it's like, you know, it's it's almost like you're striking the set and then setting up for the you know you did the matinee and now we're doing the evening show like everybody mm-hmm. is putting you know all the players are getting back into place to run it again yeah. is 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 what that feels like you know the the opening cutscene um you know especially with the context that we get here yeah 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 absolutely yeah it's, it's definitely something to keep in mind it's something that we're all we'll bring up when we talk about uh, especially at the the actual ending like we can talk about it this episode. But when we get to the ending and we talk about Soul of Cinder and what all of that kind of possibly means, that stuff's going to come up. Yeah. You know, because mm-hmm. that's definitely, I've got some thoughts um, about it. The uh, here, you know, so I guess I, that's interesting though, because if when we, I, you know, you presume when you watch that opening cutscene that uh, that is the uh, this go round that's happening, like Cole said, where it's like, oh, everyone's getting ready for the evening show. She's putting on her, her tiara. I'm going to go, that's the same person I'm going to go meet. We don't know when that happened chronologically though. That could be the soul of Cinder dragging you to the grave, which is the one we find in untended graves. And, Mm. you know, we actually, that was back then. Um, and we're actually after that. And that is why we're in this kind of dark, dark zone now, you know, Mm -hmm. it's a, it's, it's always interesting because the other thing about the, um, the intro is, uh, uh, Aldrich is, is definitely kind of portrayed differently than he is in the game. 
So I always wonder about kind of in a game development sense when those were made mm. um, and if there were changes made afterwards. Like if, if that was always the intent, if you if at any point he was meant to be literally just kind of a, a slime monster as opposed to, you know, the, definitely more, uh, you know, kind of kind of protean, but also a uh, much more kind of formful version that he actually is yeah. in the game. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Was this pre or post skeleton? Yeah. <laughs> For Aldrich. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, the fact that he's just kind of an ooze would suggest that that did happen before he had his run in with, with Gwendolyn, which would also place that chronologically, you know, in, mm. in the past as well. Um, I think that makes sense. I mean, we get the impression that the pontiff sort of stored Gwendolyn in that cathedral and let him wait for Aldrich to consume him. And mm -hmm. before he linked the fire, he was a devourer of men, not a devourer of gods. And all of a sudden, he's the devourer of gods when he gets to the cathedral. So I think, yeah, I agree. He definitely yeah. comes out uh, before, I mean, after. He, he comes out of that coffin before he consumes Gwendolyn, for sure. But yeah. you have to wonder how much they intended all of this when they made... You know, when they paid all their money for that, that trailer. How exactly. Much... <laughs> yeah. Like they just didn't have enough budget to put Ludleth in there. You don't know. <laughs> well, I, he was, I just he was there. He was just below amount. frame. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. It's a, it's a tiny, tiny budget <laughs> for, for little, little boy, little man. Um, yeah. Uh, so the outside of this is like, again, full of black knights and kind of full of treasure. Um, a lot of which, ha which has a kind of significance. Um, it's all Dark Souls 1 stuff. Um, you know, this chaos blade, the Hornet ring, um, ultimately once you get in here, you can buy Artorias set. Um, so it kind of, I think the Artorias set being here is call is with that echo that Cole mentioned about, um, us going back and defeating Artorias and kind of how Artorias of the abyss played with time, paralleling how this plays with, with champion Gundir, uh, mm -hmm. and time. But what's more kind of interesting, what we have to kind of talk about is that like that shrine handmade and the things we find here that are kind of hidden, right. um, which of course the eyes, uh, which is I'm getting, to, getting at. Yeah. Um, so the handmaid's dialogue is very confusing to me. Obviously, you know, we mentioned the fact that, okay, the bell hasn't rung and the fire isn't lit, you know, not expecting visitors. Uh, this place is a mess. Oh, dearie me. Um, but as you go to leave or as you speak to her, you know, she kind of mentions forebodingly and Gary, if you, if you want to cut this in, you can, but I'll just read it. Um, you know, tis dark for now, but fires fade and quiet. Um, or perhaps thou art captive already like the poor girl. Um, which girl? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, <laughs> I think the fire keeper is correct, but I don't know what that means. Literally. Right. Um, the fire keepers are always kind of portrayed as this pitiable, figure in this position that is not a not a happy one mm -hmm. uh, and like a, a position of even like force a forced ignorance too as we're gonna see like mm -hmm. they're they're here doing this eternal service coming back again and again um in the old version of uh um uh, fire keepers pre recon they were you know writhing with humanity and in constant pain and all of this um and now you know, we, we just know that they're in this enforced blindness you know like something and somebody you know has set up has set this custom in place to where they cannot see because if they saw the the reality of kind of what was hanging the balance of their duty they would you know be prone to treachery mm. Mm. Yeah. i definitely think that the word captive is something that pertains to just the idea of linking the fire in general and uh, the fire keeper in particular though it, it implies that she knows about she has a very good knowledge of how where she is now is not quite the only thing that's going on right now uh, Maybe you're captive already, she says, like the poor girl. I think she's referring to the firekeeper, because the firekeeper is also referred to as a prisoner by Ludleth. And the idea of a, a prisoner is also brought up in the prisoner's chain. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And I found that interesting. It says, a prisoner is one who has staked everything on a belief, uh, a proclivity of most apparent in the greatest of champions. And I thought that was interesting, everything on a belief and that's kind of what the linking of the fire is, right? It's a belief in this in this system and this cycle of the world. And I think that both you and Gundir and the Firekeeper all fit that that description. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, it's especially and that plays into the thing we're going to talk about um, when we get to the ending is that when you look at the the link the fire ending in this and something that like was the first kind of thing I came away from that is just how. Uh, kind of pathetic it is and how it is taking you know multiple kind of lord souls that you're collecting to do it uh to rekindle 
this time to, to rekindle the fire. Um, and you know, this, this framing you as a prisoner for believing that when it is actually, mm. you're getting this smaller return on your investment. Um, you know, and something I keep saying, uh, about this, this feeling I get is that it's not a, it's not a cycle, it's a spiral. You know, there's this entropic force to it that is maybe moving too slow to see in dark souls one that in dark souls three kind of becomes evident with this passage of time, you know, that like we're getting less fire when we, when we link the fire and we have to bring in these other people. Um, you know, that belief that we have is a false one, you know, framing us as a prisoner makes sense for that. Um, you know, we believe in something that may or may not be actually the case in this world. Mm. You know, um, it's crazy to see somebody alive in here when mm -hmm. you first go in here, you yeah. know, to find, I was not expecting to find an NPC, yep. you know, they're very easy to miss as well. They kind of blend in, you know, with, uh, with the lack of light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also um, wonder if her dialogue was just to to make you go looking for somebody else in this shrine because the firekeeper and the eyes are hidden behind an illusory wall. Oh, and I also hidden. wonder if yeah. she, <laughs> she mentions, you know, someone being captive, you think, is there, someone, is there somebody else in here maybe? Well, and there's Irina. Irina has, you know, ties to being a firekeeper. So if you think it is a firekeeper, you know, mm. Irina is a, can become a very useless firekeeper if you want. Um, <laughs> she should do an, an informational interview with the actual firekeeper so she learns uh, not to do it. When we were talking about the confused chronology too, though, it is, you know, the fact that Andre's hammer is here really implies that, like, this is post-Andre. You know, so that's something that actually doesn't imply this is in the past unless Andre is reborn to pick up his hammer when, you know, if a, a cycle mm. starts anew. So that's one of those little contradictory things that is a, a strange detail. Yeah. You know? Well, the, the thrones here still have the names of all the other lords we've mentioned yeah. as well. Yep. So does yeah. that mean if it's in the past that uh, they was, you know, this cycle still was a those were still the lords. Those were still yeah, the people literally who had the their cycle. names on the checklist. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of, I guess that goes into, I mean, I'm, I'm a believer that it's for the most part, the past, but also that, it, you know, when you talk about the past, it relates to this grand betrayal that <laughs> a few item descriptions mention. If we want to get into talking about Ludleth mm -hmm. and his dialogue, mm -hmm. because I think he's, you know, so fascinating because as soon as you meet Ludleth, you're, Conditioned to think this guy linked the fire, <laughs> and I think that's 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 something that's hopefully going to get explored because it's incredibly uh, up for up for grabs whether you believe that he linked the fire or not. And when he talks in his dialogue about the grand betrayal, we have to sort of figure out what was that grand betrayal, and why does he know about this place that existed in the past? Yeah, I really hope we do learn a little bit about that. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, DLC wise, because it is as is. It's not like it's entirely. I mean, I find it kind of unsatisfying, you know, that. Um, what what we know about this, right. you know, about this grand betrayal, what we know about Ludleth, um, you know, him being this kind of uh, continuity there. When I read description or uh, kind of theories that talk about untended graves as not being in the future or past, but it being this kind of, uh, you know, this alternate kind of take this kind of do over or uh, kind of pocket dimension kind of thing. Ludleth is usually the kind of prime mover in that, in those theories. And because of that continuity he has the fact that he does know things from both worlds. Um, but I mm. don't know why he does, you know, I don't, uh, I don't know what gives him that position of, of power, or why he has that knowledge when other people seem to be ignorant to it, or at least just tight lipped mm. about it. Yeah. So he definitely has a lot of knowledge. We should Sorry, yeah. we, we should say what we know about this because by exploring the dark shrine, we end up finding this uh, very creepy pair of you know what are called fire keepers eyes, um, and their description, and then ultimately conversations with with, with Ludleth, um, kind of allude to the fact that you know these are forbidden fire keepers are not allowed to have eyes. Um, you know, it reveals eyes are the, for closers. Yeah. <laughs> So. <laughs> ABS always be seeing um, it yeah. reveals to the sightless firekeepers things they should never see and that these belonged to the first firekeeper. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and through talking to Ludwig, he, he recognized this, recognized them and says, Oh, where did you find those? It's been, you know, an incredibly long time. And there's like this very poignant story where Ludwig was actually like traveling with his firekeeper at that time or something like that. You know, he was with a crew 
and she put the eyes in and saw something you know this um you know this world without flame with these beckoning little lights off in the distance and this thin line you know of of, of brightness that was tempting them away from their duty and you know like that would have been a betrayal and Ludlith kind of implies you know in a, in a sideways fashion saying like oh you know we had to make sure that didn't happen so i needed to take the uh i forget what he says but you know like we're gonna make our own fate we're gonna do this and he hid the eyes you know and that was the way that he kind of saved the fire at the very least by you know stopping his keeper from putting it out Hmm. you also have to wonder if it's his keeper or if he was sort of was he the main character in this entire thing or was he sitting on the throne sort of similar to like he was now (laughs) an observer Mm. of these events he was a squatter (laughs) yeah a little he's just gotten there because he, also, he says, we did all we could to spare her from them. And I th- assume he's talking about the eyes. Do you yeah. think he's talking about that? Spare her from this vision of, of darkness. And, yeah, yeah. Um, this fate that will befall us. And, you know, he's, then he says, much will happen since. And then he says, maybe I should apprise you. And then he tells you basically nothing. <laughs> he does a, he, there's a lot he's leaving out of this story, is what I'm I'm trying to say. Like... And then he says he willed himself Lord so he could link the fire and paint a new vision. That's a very simple way of putting it. He just, just willed himself Lord, right? Yeah. That's, he just, it just happened. It was so easy. He makes yeah. it sound so simple. We don't get any indication <laughs> of how was he powerful enough to do this. Not everyone can do this. Yeah. Exactly, because it, well, power is the, the primary thing that we've been led to believe that kind of qualifies one for lordship prior mm. to this. Like if you're going to have a qualification, like, you know, you're made a lord of cinder not because of you know because of any great love of the people but because of might you know that is yeah. that is what does it um yeah it is we i just feel like we don't know enough about ludla like there's a there's a weird way that npcs in dark souls 3 stop talking before i want them to stop talking and it's <laughs> you know the, the the me help any time problem um mm. you know where it's just they start repeating dialogue like one paragraph before i feel like they should <laughs> Um, yeah. and I just, you know, it's one of those things with the DLC where I'm, I'm very curious about it. I'm really looking forward to it. But when I saw what the DLC was going to be concerned with, I really wanted it to be something that at least, I mean, it still could have ties to these unanswered questions, but I wanted it to, to at least like suggest more that it was going to have direct kind of ties to some of these unanswered questions. And mm-hmm. I really, you know, the second one could still do that. There's still kind of hope, but the, uh, yeah, I really, really kind of require more stuff. Ludleth, and I don't want it to be, uh, you know, return to Artorias, which is my my great fear, <laughs> is that it's just going to yeah, be a, yeah. a, you know, another uh, a side another side area from Dark Souls One kind of re-explored. So, well, there's just something missing from his story, right? Uh, I don't yeah. know if you found that. I was trawling through the Extra Life Wiki when I was reading his dialogue, and I found one that's actually very difficult to come by. Um, if you did, you ever kill Ludleth and then talk to him afterwards? Uh, I didn't, but I read his dialogue and it's very, mm. uh, kind of like fitful. Like this, yeah. like, it's either that this has happened before or he doesn't register. Um, well, that, when you kill him and you talk to him again, he says it singe, it singeth to the bone. It hurts. He has this sort of fever dream, right. Of going through being burnt alive. That's what the dialogue implies. Mm-hmm. And then he wakes and he's forgotten about it. And you know, mm-hmm. at that point you're thinking, oh, he's just dreaming about linking the fire, but he doesn't, he's not happy about it. You know, if that's what that is, if he's dreaming about how painful it was to link the fire and sacrifice himself, he's saying it hurts. I can't bear it. Help me. Mm -hmm. And then after you kill the dragon slayer armor and you perform this again, you kill him and you talk to him once he's come back to life. Um, he says, see ye not, I am a Lord, a wee flame belike, but I shoulder the world. Forgive me. Oh, please. I'm not to blame. I'm not. There's just so much guilt Mm -hmm. related to him. Yeah. Yeah. This linking of the fire, but that's not what he wants you to believe when he talks to you. When he talks to you, he's he encourages you along that path and how it's the right decision to make. And he also doesn't seem too bothered if you betray the world. He doesn't <laughs> say you have to link the fire. No. He's like, if you're going to betray the world, take it into your own hands, which could be one of the endings, which is where you literally do take <laughs> the fire into your own hands. The the firekeeper is the same way too. The firekeeper just says. Hey, it's your choice. You do yep. you. I exist to serve you. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it's just the, 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 these weird kind of dueling relationships with agency. You know, Ludlith, at least his outward persona is, you know, you've got to fuck it, live life to the hill, right? Like <laughs> own it, you know, even if anybody tells you that you can't, well, you're going to do it. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you that you can't. 
Um, whereas the, uh, the fire keeper, if you give her the eyes and talk to her about this, about the world without fire, uh, she says, well, you know, I serve you and I'm going to trust your judgment and we're going to stand, we're going to stand together through this. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's perplexing. Like it is, it is hard to ascribe, um, a consistent or singular motivation to Ludlow, uh, in, in light of that, you know, we have yeah. things that suggest that he did a lot of things to kind of avoid, um, that that outcome but then he also does not seem to be bothered if it happens again um mm. yeah and a lot implies that he did indeed link the fire i mean there's a giant throne with his name on it in all the worlds so he's mm -hmm. clearly this figure of power and the main thing that uh, sets him apart is transposing or transposition which is what he was exiled for i believe i think that's mentioned yeah. outright yeah and this art of transposition is when you take the essence of a soul and repurpose it into something that represents it. And that's usually a weapon or a ring. Mm -hmm. And Lud and Corland, it's one of the descriptions says that one of the transposed things is one of Corland's, which is where Ludleth is from, uh, one of Corland's transposed wonders. And that puts transposition in a really positive light. But there's also descriptions that say that the art of transposition is forbidden and it can't be both at the same time. You know, they can't be yeah. like, well, look at these wonders, but don't do it. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think that, you know, the obvious thing is that it became forbidden. And um, that's mm -hmm. when Lord Leth was exiled because he clearly carried on doing it. And he's good at it. And <laughs> yeah. he has a ring called the skull ring. And yeah. that's, you know, the essence of a powerful creature. So if he was to link the fire, I have a feeling that skill of his, this skill of his might be a part of that. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's using another creature's strength to link the fire. Maybe that's what makes him so unique. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I always forget that the, um, the skull ring, which the, the description, uh, the skull ring makes you easier to be detected by enemies, like increases mm -hmm. their aggro range. <laughs> uh, that the description says the soul feeder was a beast that insatiably absorbed souls to feed its power. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, even, everything even in after, the game. Yeah, well, exactly. Like, and definitely the the player character, and the um, the two things like one, the fact that um, you know, the player character is insatiably like eating souls, and that transmission makes me think of soul arts and think of some of the theming and demon souls, which when you are kind of explicitly brought into question for absorbing all this power and like characters are, it's kind of part of the the text for characters to be like, hey. You're, you know, the mechanics are intersecting with the story. You're absorbing all this power. Don't throw it away. You can become a god, you know, mm -hmm. which, uh, uh, what's his head? Uh, Sorcerer McGee says in, uh, in Demon Souls. <laughs> so it's just, it's right? kind of, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, it's like a remnant from a theme that was more prominent in an earlier game. Um, yeah, I think Demon Souls did a better job of conveying how central souls were yeah. to the, to the world and using them for arts and power and, Dark Souls tends to take it more for granted, in a sense. It's mm -hmm. just sort of there. Just like some creatures are huge and some are small, and <laughs> somehow you get their weapons in your inventory. Like, there are just some things that take it for granted, and I feel like soul power is kind of one of those things Yeah. in Souls. Yeah. Mm. It becomes, in, in Dark Souls 1, it becomes ammo. Like, it becomes, <laughs> you know, soul, soul darts and soul streams and stuff like that. It becomes yeah. just kind of stuff you can shoot. Same thing, there's also things where, like, in, in Dark Souls 1... Some of the gameplay mechanics I felt like were more tied to story things. Like I was just discussing this with somebody, but um, how important bonfires were yeah. uh, in one, like how they yeah. actually meant something to the story. And it was like, oh, I'm burning humanity at this bonfire that has the significance that can tie into the grander story. Whereas here they're just kind of a, a means of conveyance. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there's not too much to, to kind of dig beneath the surface here. And I think I think they were on the verge of making them more of a story point bonfires that is we've all seen the pre-release footage where someone was clearly in the process of creating a bonfire or at least impaling someone with a stick with a fire effect you know mm -hmm. so i would have liked to see that explored a little bit more but as it is they're just these things that are undeniably linked and always present in the world yeah just kind of uh it's kind of legacy things yeah mm. um yeah i mean i don't think do we have what else do we have um about you know, kind of untended graves to talk about. I, we didn't come to any conclusions, but we knew that was going to be the case. Right. Um, we, kind of going the, into it. The best that we can, you know, so, so what's, what, what's the net effect of this? Um, what we did was we reached into the past, got, got a lot more questions than answers. 
but kind of pulled back this very dangerous thing that has, you know, very profound implications for the ending of the game and the course that the cycle or spiral can take, you know, as you kind of reach this juncture and make your decision at the end, you know, mm -hmm. ultimately that's, that's what you get out of doing this. That's your big, big reward aside from some really cool boss fights and a couple of what the fuck moments between, mm -hmm. between these two things, between the consumed King's garden and untended graves, I think we get like this really great, you know, kind of mixture of things that really remind me of why I love souls, which are the pathos of Osiris and the mystery and bafflement and weirdly like the, like the peace of the dark version of the cemetery and, and, and the shrine, you know, a couple of yeah. our responses draw some parallels between the shrine and like Ash Lake, um, you know, um, you know, both tonally and just kind of like cosmologically. Um, and I think that both of these kind of back to back serve as a great kind of like billboard that they, you know, they, <laughs> they wanted to include this somewhere and it shows up. I think that it comes out very well. I do too. Mm. I wish that, you know, I wouldn't trade the moment of kind of bafflement that came with realizing what this was for anything, but I do some of these contradictory things. Like I said, there's, I'm of two minds where like part of me wants it, wants it to be able to, you know, I, I try not to turn souls games into an equation I can solve. Like I don't want to treat the world like that, but part of me does want those things to not be contradictory so I can mm -hmm. figure it out. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. if it felt a little bit, uh, you know, Sloppy is the wrong word for this, or at least it's, it, it is a word that has worse connotations. If it, if it felt a little bit more considered or if things lined up just a little bit better, um, yeah. I'm not asking for them to chew, to, you know, to choose, uh, chew my steak for me. Um, uh, yeah, for, it, I'll let you Name decide. If, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I will let you decide if, if that is actually what I'm asking for when I say maybe things could have lined up a little bit better, but they, you know, they probably, if it's a, if it's a problem of proofreading, I would totally believe it. Um, and it makes me wish for a, uh, a scholar style rewrite of some of those descriptions all the more. Hmm. Yeah. Or translation. You know, which I, I haven't, uh, you know, I've done a little bit of looking through a, a big translation document, but I haven't read the thing kind of yeah. front to back because it's a big, long document that has every item description in the game. <laughs> so it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's more than I, than I can, I can really do. Um, you mentioned, Mati, do you, is that do you have a translation kind of... from Japanese? Sorry. <laughs> is that a translation well, more... from Japanese you mentioned? Yes. Yeah. There's a document right. floating around that has a lot of the, um, item descriptions and area names and the like. Yeah. With uh, direct mm. translations, the unkindled yeah. are firewood. If I'm, if I'm to, if I remember correctly, yeah, it, it's it's really enlightening going through when you can like just by virtue of having two languages that both you can sort of trust to a degree. It gives you more of an idea of what the developers sort of wanted to convey because some words in some languages transfer some so much more information than, uh, you know. The words in English do. Mm -hmm. They have much more cultural meaning that can be explained. And you can tell sometimes that the English translation team couldn't quite capture that in the same way. Uh, some phrases are omitted when you go through different translations. And yeah, I've yet to look at all that, but I hope there's something in there for the untended graves for sure. Yeah. yeah. Buddy, do you have any kind of wrap up thoughts on this, this area um, before we, we kind of wrap up? Um, I think that you can't underestimate how closely related this place is to Lothric. I mean, you can talk a lot about how, when it was and where it is in terms of like dimensions and stuff like that, because there's so much overlap. But I think the fact to take away is that this was connected to Lothric. They had a little back alley into this shrine <laughs> and um, the queen visited this shrine. There's so much related to Lothric here. And I think that the Grand Betrayal might have something to do, if not directly referencing the fact that Prince Lothric isn't linking the fire. Um, it can at least show sort of like the dangers of that. But it also shows how the cycle goes on regardless, right? And mm -hmm. you're sort of powerless to this this belief and this system. And there's so much in here that talks about being captive and uh, being a prisoner. You know, the Shrine Handmaiden says she's just captive to the Shrine's curse. Gundy is a prisoner. Firekeep is a prisoner as well. So are you really. But yeah, yeah. I, I just think it's if you can't draw anything from this place conclusively, just that it's intended to do that. It's intended to make you question the cycle for sure. 
it does, it does a great job. I think what Cole was saying, and even if you can't draw anything directly from it, it does evoke ideas and feelings uh, as well, if not better than any other area in the game, I think. Kind of make mm. you ask those questions and kind of get that those tones and themes across, uh, which is, you know, often that that is the primary way I want to engage with these games. You know, part of me does want to solve the riddle, but part of me also is more interested in kind of the the broad strokes ideas uh, mm. that, that that you know they're trying to get across. Um, I think this this area does a good job of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, Vadi, thank you for thank you for joining us. Before we, because uh, we will let you go before we do all our admin stuff. We we traditionally do just so you don't have to hear us blather on. Um, where can uh, where can people uh, find you online? Um, so people can find me on YouTube, on youtubecom slash video. Um, and yeah, I hope I find a few p- listeners from the show. I uh, I'm a huge fan of the show, and thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. That's very, that's, flattering. That's very flattering. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's a. Uh, no, we said that perfectly in sync. <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't planned. Um, it it is very flattering. I really appreciate you you coming on. Um, you know, you're like it like Cole said at the beginning, one of our most requested guests, um, if not the most requested. And uh, you know, I'm a I'm a big fan of your work. It is a yeah. you know, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. It's a pleasure to get to meet you uh, last year. And uh, yeah, yeah, and you know, really appreciate everything you do. Yeah, I'm just so happy about, you know, the fact that there's people in the community that have just sorted out every avenue of things. There's so many great people doing podcasts, so many great people doing videos now and writing and every avenue now as we sort of get to the end of the Soul series is everyone's sort of found their niche and it's just such a huge bustling community and it's, you know, just great to be a part of that and you guys are doing a great job representing that side of the community too. Oh, thank you. So yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me on. So as per our usual, we let uh, Vati go. But as always, uh, I want to say, you know, encourage people who are listening to support our guest. And what a nice guy <laughs> and very generous with his time. Like he's yeah. very busy. And I love that he takes the time to uh, to do that Yep, a pil- uh, with a us. Pillar of the community. Really, really yeah. appreciate <laughs> that. It is covered. not. Yeah, it is not an exaggeration when I was saying earlier that like the, the, the his work like informed how i think about these games or mm-hmm. the way a way to approach these games and it is possible that the show would not exist or would not exist the way that it does mm. uh, without his work so yeah it is uh all 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 due credit yeah um, which is quite a bit so check the show notes for the links to all of his stuff yeah and if you and if you're somehow unfamiliar like that is a that is a good time yeah um so i i envy you having <laughs> a bunch of videos to sit down and uh and watch yeah um yeah and hopefully, uh, you know, in this episode too, it is, uh, this episode has, is full of question marks, which I, you know, we express. So on our end and everything, and hopefully, uh, you know, yours, it's like, we weren't going to come to any answers on this. Uh, nobody has any answers on this stuff. Nope. You know, so it is, uh, it is, it was really fun to have somebody who, one of the things I like about his work and the Dark Souls lore people who I gravitate towards, this is true where they don't try to think, say things definitively. Yeah. Um, they just kind of will bring up questions and kind of bring up these connections and everything. And he's mm-hmm. really great at that. And this area is great for that because, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's pretty rare that we get to say something, you know, we don't try not to say things too definitively either because um, it's not always there. And this is a great episode for asking interesting questions. Yeah. So. For absolutely. sure. Yeah. Um, next time uh, we're going to be talking about Lothric Castle. Uh, we're going to be joined by Jeremy Greer mm-hmm. of uh, the Don't Give Up Skeleton podcast of the brand new Duckfeed uh, show Days of Future Cast. Mm-hmm. Just came um, out and, yesterday. If you're listening to this episode when it uh, came out, yeah, frequent uh, frequent guest on this show and a good buddy. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, that's going to be really fun. Um, and it's going to be going up through uh, the uh, boss with the uh, the Dragon Slayer armor mm-hmm. up through that. Yeah, he just happens to have it, like you know, the boss with it. He's yeah it. exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean well i mean the boss around it hovering above it controlling it with its mind yep uh, most likely uh so yeah so that's gonna that's gonna be really fun um we have other special episodes we're gonna try to do this season we'll announce those as they get closer as well as other special uh top and bottom uh 10 kind of episode things that will come out will be trickling out and you can follow us on social media to find announcements about those yeah or just uh you know subscribe to the feed like that's an amazing way to get all that new stuff when it comes out Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, what else can they do? Well, we have a Patreon. Um, that is patreon.com slash duckfeed TV. You hear about it a lot. Uh, but that new show we mentioned, it's only possible because of the generous support of, you know, backers and patrons who have, you know, kicked in a couple of bucks, uh, here and there getting us to a new goal. Um, that mm-hmm. is days of future cast, uh, with Gary, uh, yourself and, uh, Jeremy, uh, where you talk about the X-Men animated series right now. I know there are plans to take it into other X-Men related things in the future, but so excited to have Jeremy on board kind of like officially as part of the, uh, as part of the network kind of helping us, uh, make that really funny show. Mm-hmm. X-Men are great. <laughs> um, I love talking about X-Men. They are ridiculous. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have other goals. Um, you can check out the next one is the exploration of the dark tower books. Um, Radio Free Midworld. We're mm-hmm. going to be releasing a pilot for that soon, and we have other shows we want to do um, that are, you know, we we say this all the time, we're super transparent about it, that are contingent of, on us doing our day jobs less. <laughs> uh, and in order to do our day, day jobs less, we need uh, to be able to pay rent and stuff. Yep. So that is why those are tied to financial goals. Yep. Um, so if you hit that up, um, if you want to support us, you get a lot of stuff for it. You get shows a day early, but you get access to a lot of other things, bonus mm-hmm. shows. Um, miscellaneous uh, kind of things, you know, kind of little little perks, little blogs that you'll get to read. Um, there's a lot of value that we provide uh, for that. Yeah, um, I truly believe. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to support, uh, you know, kind of a one-time thing rather than a rolling donation, even though a rolling donation of a dollar a month is a big difference. Um, if you want to do a one-time thing, you can go to uh, duckfeed.tv forward slash tip jar mm-hmm. or duckfeed.tv forward slash store. Yep. or duckfeed.tv forward slash shirts yeah. and do uh, any of those things, buy something or uh, make a donation or use the Amazon referral link found therein. Mm-hmm. Um, all those things help us out yep. quite a bit. They'll make a big difference. Yes. Um, what else can they do? Um, I, I I can't think of any other like admin kind of stuff. Just stick around. Rate mm-hmm. and review the show on iTunes. Yes, there we go. Uh, just I, I don't know why I said that like you were. It was like I dunked on you for forgetting because it's. <laughs> we say it every episode and everyone knows. Uh, <laughs> right, but, <laughs> but, the, but uh, you just see it's it's a little inc- incantation incantation you say because every time we say it we might get a review out of it. So yeah, yeah. I was I was just I was like what one oh you're missing yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. you're missing one part mm, yeah. you forgot yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, mostly just, uh, we thank you for, for sticking around. Yeah. Um, you know, if it wasn't for you guys, like we, we get, uh, we're able to get these kind of guests and stuff on the show because we have, you know, this list like, because partly because of us, because we, you know, do the level of quality that we like to maintain, but also because we have this listener base and because we have this support that we've kind of built up a reputation where yeah. we can reach out to somebody and say like, Hey, do you want to do the show? And they don't look at us like we're going to, you know, <laughs> I don't know, prank them or trick them into being on like a Sonic <laughs> show or something like that <laughs> just a you show know, about the sonic series we're not just going to spit out memes like harambe memes who would do that like that's not the kind of thing that we're going to do in an episode and people know that because we have a reputation <laughs> so <laughs> we yeah. have a reputation yeah so uh uh oh shit <sighs> what up <laughs> what should they do until next time oh gosh like precious embers left to us by past lords linkers of the fire that's not even that's not even a, a verb there's no verb in that that's fuck advice my friend <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, that's okay though it's a quick and it asks more questions than, than oh, it answers yeah stay that path yeah. find lords to link the fire and i will blindly tend the flame there we go umbasa umbasa and we all pray that we will have far more 